There's another one you don't want to hear. Frankly, neither do I. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of the Power Chord Hour podcast. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Merchant, welcoming you to another episode. Very excited about this one. And hopefully you are doing all right out there, staying uh, happy and uh, staying sane while you're stuck inside. I, uh, I'm definitely someone who goes stir crazy very easily. I love being outside. I love hiking, going on, uh, you know, just hidden trails, going traveling, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I go stir crazy very easy. And as it gets really, as it gets nicer and nicer out, it, it gets even harder. But uh, thankfully, inside indoor stuff, you know, I still get to do the radio show, get to do the podcast, uh, get to do interviews for both of them, and you know, been playing a lot of guitar and a lot of bass. And, uh, you know, a couple a couple things to keep me happy and uh, keep me sane right now. But hopefully all of you have some stuff, you know, to keep you that way as well. Keep you content and uh, happy. And hopefully hopefully this will keep you entertained for a little while, this episode for you. And we got a good one for you. Not, not to my own credit. This goes, all the credit goes to having a really, really good guest for you. And uh, tonight or today, I always say tonight because I'm used to doing the radio show. If you're listening to the radio show, it's at 10 o'clock at night. So I'm always, I'm always saying tonight. But uh, whenever you're listening to this, um, we, we're talking with Greg Eklund, former drummer of Everclear. He played with the band from uh, 1994 to 2003. He played on all the huge records. I mean, any Everclear song that you hear on the radio, that's him playing drums. You see the music videos on TV, that's him playing drums. And he, he was, he was on, in there for all the big stuff. And uh, on top of that, also after Everclear became the frontman of the Ulas, a band who we definitely talk about as well. A um, really great band who really, I had heard a little bit before, but uh, I'll be honest, I checked them out more after this interview, after talking to Greg about them. And uh, really, really good stuff. I mean, I'm definitely, you're going to hear them more on the radio show now that uh, now that I've kind of checked them out more. I, I'd known... I'd known about the Ulaws, I'll be honest. Like, I knew about them. I, I think I had heard a song or two. Um, They actually, funny enough, and I didn't put two and two together, they'd have a song on the Spider-Man 3 soundtrack, which I bought when that came out. So I've definitely heard the Ulaws before. But uh, check them out more after this interview and was very happy with what I found. So, I mean, Greg also does that and is uh, currently working on some stuff with them and a bunch of other stuff. Also plays drums for Storm Large. Like, he does so many different things. I think that's so cool because, I mean, they're, you know what I mean? Like, none of those are the same. Like, Everclear, Storm Large, and the Ulaz, none, none of those sound alike. I would, I would not group any of those together. I mean, Everclear and the Ulaz are both kind of like alternative, you know, kind of like rock bands, but kind of on, I feel like different sides of the spectrum as well, though. So, you know, I, I like, I like that he can do all these different things and, you know, we, we get into what he's up to, but, uh, another big thing, I mean, really the, uh, the whole, the whole thing surrounding this interview, the big thing we talk about is sparkle and fade Everclear's sophomore record and Greg's first with the band. And, uh, it's really probably become my favorite Everclear record. If, if you asked me like two years ago, I'd have said so much for the afterglow afterglow is always my favorite. And then like two years ago, I started listening to sparkle and fade more and I'm like, Oh shit, this might be. That this one might be my favorite, and uh, I don't know now. Sparkle and fade, sparkle and fade is 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 up there now as my favorite. I I would say it took over for uh, Afterglow. I mean, I I don't know. I guess in a world without without uh you know competition, they could both comfortably sit there at uh, at number one. But if you're forcing me to pick, yeah, I, I'd go sparkle and fade. But uh, yeah, that bad boy turns 25 this year. We talk all about it, writing, recording, and uh, touring off of it. We get into all that. It was just so absolutely rad to do this. I mean, I've been listening to Everclear for so damn long. I mean, you know, Afterglow probably would have been the first one that I remember. I mean, Sparkle and Fade, um, I mean, if we're talking, this turns 25. I'm 27, so at age two, I don't remember this one coming out. But uh, so much for the Afterglow, you know, I remember seeing the music videos, hearing stuff on the radio, all that. So, I mean, you know, I've been listening to Greg's music for most of my life. And, uh, you know, part of part of stuff, too, as well, you know, that it, it's funny because I was thinking this. I've been listening to him for so long, but it's like if I look at, like, other stuff I was listening to at, like, the age that I probably first heard, 
you know, like Everclear, it's like, yeah, a lot of that was terrible. Whereas Everclear, it's like, oh, I like that more as I get older. You know, it, it's funny because a lot of that stuff you listen to as you're much younger, a lot of it you kind of regret or go like, oh, man, that was kind of shitty. Whereas like Everclear, I, I've just liked more and more, I think, as I've gotten older. So this was awesome to talk to Greg. I mean, he was he was awesome. He was funny. And, uh, you know, this one, this one goes on quite a while. If you, if you haven't seen the, uh, the, uh, time on it, you know, which, which I'm stoked for, I mean, I was happy about this. I mean, having him on and then having this in-depth of a conversation with someone I've been listening to for so long is absolutely rad. You know, I, I thought that was so cool. So I don't want to cut anything out. I, I think if you're a fan of, uh, Greg's work, you're gonna, you're gonna really like this. He told me a lot of things, which I don't know, maybe I've just never, uh, Maybe I've just never read the right interviews or heard the right interviews or something, but a lot of things he was telling me in this, I've never heard him talk about before. So uh, I'm very stoked on it, and we're going to get right into it. But before that, I do want to thank our sponsors for this episode. I want to thank Podcorn, who uh, have sponsored us before, and a really, really cool one. This is something, listen listen up if you do your own podcast, because this is for you. Um, Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities. They got host ad reads, interview segments, topical discussions, all that different stuff. And it doesn't matter, you know, how long you've been doing it or the size of your podcast. I mean, I, I've been at the podcast now for you know, I don't know, four months or so, you know, we've been doing the radio show a little longer, but the podcast is still very new and uh, we're already using Podcorn. So, you know, maybe you just started or you've been around a while. Either way, you know, it's going to help you out a lot if you're a podcaster and uh, you never give up any rights to your podcast, which is a nice thing. I, I, I definitely, you know, worried about things like that. Podcorn is here to support you at your every step and ensure you're protected and compensated for the work that you do for brands. And it is, it's simple and easy. The whole interface is really nice you know you get on there you find you find sponsorships that work for you and your podcast and uh, you know you go from there but uh, the whole way it's nice in a smooth easy transaction so I want to thank Podcorn for sponsoring this episode very very cool I want to thank our other sponsor Fruit of the Bean Coffee you know I've, I've been drinking loads and loads of coffee lately you know staying staying wired so I can work on uh, you know work on interview questions and the podcast and the radio show and all that and uh, this is a great company. Go check them out. Your coffee is not roasted until after you order, so you know that Fruit of the Bean coffee is always fresh. 10% of their net profits go to support orphans and those affected by human trafficking, so you're even helping a, a good cause when you uh, get from them. And what they're doing right now, which is very cool, they're offering all of their coffee at 20% until further notice while uh, we work through the health and financial turbulence. So you save a little money there with 20% off there, which is uh, very cool. So you're helping out people. You're getting fresh coffee, and uh, you know they're giving you a little discount because obviously right now times are kind of tough for everyone. So go check out Fruit of the Bean Coffee, and I want to thank them and Podcorn for sponsoring this episode. And uh, yeah, so let's let's get into the interview. I, I think everyone's going to enjoy this. I, I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed doing it. This was awesome to do. So right now here is Greg Eklund talking 25 years of Sparkle and Fade right here on the Power Chord Hour podcast. On the Power Chord Hour, we are talking to former Everclear drummer Greg Eklund. And uh, Greg played drums in the band from 94 until 2003. He played on the band's best-selling records. And tonight we're going to talk about the uh, sophomore release, Sparkle and Fade. That was released 25 years ago, back in uh, 1995. We're going to talk all about that, as well as uh, discussing what he's currently up to with his band, The Ulas, his solo work, and a whole lot more. So, Greg, how you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. So I've been very excited for this, you know, getting getting into Sparkle and Fade. You know, that was obviously the uh, band's second record, your first one with them. How did you end up joining Everclear? Oh, my goodness. That is it is a great story, but it is a long story. Um, I'll see if I can quickly do the abridged version, although past experience means it usually takes two or three beers to get all the way through it. But um <laughs> I was actually, I'd been in a bunch of bands in Portland, um, and actually some of them were bigger uh, bands than Everclear was at the time in Portland, but um, we had stayed local. Everclear had always toured from day one. Um, They'd always saved the money, went touring, came back home, and, um, you know, uh, would work to save some more money and keep doing that. So I always respected them for doing that, but um, I basically... God, this is a real. I'm really sorry. There's no other way to sort of tell this except slightly long winded. Hey, hope there, you have just there's a little, no a little bit of time. Oh, no problem with it. You can as long as it takes, man. I think people are interested in hearing this kind of stuff. Okay, I was, um, <clears throat> I was 
a student at University of Oregon and I got I got asked to leave or I got kicked out basically because I wasn't I wasn't really studying. Um, I, that sounds exciting and it sounds like I was like partying and stuff, but that wasn't true. I just um, I had started a band and and um, it's more focused on music than schoolwork, so my grades just suffered. So it was it's not as exciting as it sounds. But <clears throat> my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, actually continued on. So when I moved back or when I moved back to Portland with, or moved to Portland with my new band, um, I would come back periodically to visit her in Eugene, Oregon, which is a couple hours away from Portland. Um, she just happened to move right next door to my very best friend uh, at the time and still today. And um, I, when I came down to visit her, she said, oh, I'm not feeling well. I think I have a flu. Um, and so I went next door to my friend's house. And he's like, oh, this band K-Pants is playing. We both liked. Um, they're opening for Everclear. And um, he said, K-Pants might be looking for a drummer. And I liked K-Pants. So I was like, yeah, OK, um, let's go check them out. And I knew those guys, so I, but I hadn't seen them in a while. So I, I was like, I was trying to go there to get the, the drum gig. What I didn't know at the time was that ever, that the date in Eugene was Everclear's last date on a national tour that they just toured from the West Coast to the East Coast and back again, during which time they'd gotten a lot of label interest and they played a showcase in New York City that didn't go well for various <laughs> reasons. I've heard, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I but I heard I've just heard stories and stuff. But basically on the on the tour back to the West Coast from the East Coast, they decided that they were gonna make a drummer change. Um, and it turns out that they K Pants was opening for them the next night my band was playing the same gig in Eugene. That's why I'd come down a day early was to see my girlfriend, but my band was playing the next night after Everclear had played. See what I mean? It's a little bit of a story. I'm trying to keep it, trying to keep it short, but <clears throat> I was there trying to get the Cape Hands drum gig. Unbeknownst to me at the time, Everclear was looking to make a drummer change. They just hadn't told anybody except that they had called this one guy, a guy out of Seattle, um, uh, Rob Cunningham, who used to, I think he played with the Lemons up in Seattle. Like I said, it's a little fuzzy. And they wanted him to come down and check them out as a possible replacement <clears throat> for Scott. He was there <clears throat> incognito. Nobody knew him or knew why he was there. Um, so in the dr in the room that night was the current drummer of Everclear, the guy that they figured they were going to bring in or were going to audition. And then me, who was actually trying to hustle the, <laughs> the drum gig of the opening band. <laughs> And um, so, so I guess uh, they played their show and they were great. And they they left, drove back up to Portland. And I stayed the next night because my band played. And the sound guy that was touring with Everclear on that tour was asked to do the show to stay behind in Eugene and do the, my band show by somebody. And so he sort of took me aside and he goes, "Yeah, um, I think Everclear might be looking for a new drummer." And I was like, "Oh, okay." I said, great, give me Art's telephone number. And this is, you know, pre-Facebook and instant messaging and all this <laughs> stuff. If you, if, you, if you didn't have a phone number, you, you know, unless you knew the person, you'd have to start calling around asking people if they had someone's number. And he said he wouldn't give it to me because he had had some disagreement with Art and had decided that he didn't want to to help him further. So he told me that they were, might be looking for a drummer. Um, so basically, I remember that the one... <laughs> so convoluted the woman that booked the band that i was playing with at the time and that band's name is nero uh, was nero's rome and actually there's a guy doing a documentary on nero's rome in portland because i just did an interview with him last summer um talking about nero's rome but oh that's cool yeah it, it was pretty cool the blast from the past i mean um anyway i remembered that the woman that actually booked the show dates for Nero's room had once told me oh i live next door to art from everclear so i called her up sort of under the pretense of Hey, what's the next Nero's Rome shows we got coming up? <laughs> oh, and then by the way, do you have art from Everclear's numbers? She was like, yeah, sure. So that was like a week later. Unbeknownst to me, they sent Rob home. Um, they may have even have jammed with him, but he didn't know the songs. And so um, they they sent him home to learn the songs that week. And he was going to drive down the next week and play with it, play with him again. But they also had a tour starting in like a week or two weeks. So it was kind of like he was going to be the guy, but his drum studio was on the second floor of a warehouse building or something um, where the, where the stairs were outside and it's Seattle. So it was raining all the time. 
So when he was loading out his drums, he slipped and fell down two flights of stairs and like cracked his wrist, or cracked, his, cracked his ribs. I don't know if he broke, I think he may have broken his wrist. And so the, so he went to the emergency room and Art Craig are sitting down in Portland going, where is this guy? He was supposed to be here, you know, hours ago. And again, this is pre texting and, Oh, you know, um, and so suddenly he called and said, Oh, I'm in the emergency room getting a cast put on my hand and I got cracked ribs and all this stuff. Jeez. And so Art was like, Oh, okay. So they get off the phone and Art turned to Craig and said, what are we going to do? What are, you know, we can't continue with, with Scott and, but we don't have a drama for these two weeks. And then literally within 30 seconds of that happening, I just happened to call and go, Hey, I hear you guys. Are for a drummer. <laughs> that worked That's, out. And that worked out. And he said, okay. Uh, he later claimed that he knew downtown, but I don't, I mean, he knew he, that he had heard that I was a drummer to check out, but I don't know if that's actually true or not um, because I played in, in slightly just different genre bands than what Everclear was. But, um, but he said, okay, come down here tomorrow, learn these songs, these three songs or whatever it was off of their, e off of their, was it their, e no, I guess World of Noise. It was World of Noise, but I only had, I think the EP. I don't think I have the full record. So anyway, I learned three songs that they had a friend that owned a, re a punk rock record store. And in the back room, I came down, set up the drums and I played, I think we played Nervous and Weird first. And they just stopped after the first song and said, hey, we don't even need to play the other ones. Do you want to be in the band? And I was like, yeah, sure. And um, and yeah, and then two weeks later, we were being flown down to, to LA and being signed. And, dry, and then we turned around and drove straight to New York city. So the whole drive from, from LA to New York city, I, I learned as many other songs on my cassette Walkman. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, uh, you know, and the three days or four days it took to get out there. That's all I did was just over, uh, over and over and over and over and over again. And, um, and I was still pretty terrible initially, but it didn't matter because we were playing to like, uh, three or four people, you know, a night, like it was, you know, it was nothing. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So that's the long winded answer <laughs> now I, that we've taken up all of your time, but that's, it's a great story because it literally hangs on just, you know, timing and the way things work. You know, some people are like, Oh, well, you were really lucky. And maybe I was, but it was really about timing. That's, that's how, how it all just sort of fell into it, I guess. No, that whole, that whole thing's crazy. I mean, that's honestly, I, I think it's interesting. I think anyone like listening to that, who is a fan would be interested in hearing those kinds of things. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's just kind of crazy how that happens. And yeah, that's uh, I don't, I don't know. I guess, I guess in the end, it yeah, it ended up working better than getting that first band gig. I, I think it ended up uh, in your favor. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. That's 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 totally true. But it, it all happened so fast. I mean, I remember, you know, when we flew down to L.A. to sign. Like I, I'd only known them maybe maybe a week, maybe wow. a week and a half. I don't know. It may be, and you know what? Again. As we're talking 25 years ago, memory may be a little fuzzy, but I know it was within two weeks. And I remember I wasn't even sure how to pronounce Art's last name <laughs> even then, you know. So I was like, I go, gosh, sooner or later, I got to figure out how to pronounce his last name. <laughs> I'm on a major label band with the dude. I've got to figure this out. So when you when you joined, I mean, had they started uh, like writing songs for Sparkle and Fade yet? Um, I don't not. I uh, There was. <laughs> They had already written songs. I don't Sparkle and Fade wasn't around anyone's head yet. They had they had written some um back then, maybe today, I don't know. Music industry is completely different now. Um, but back then when they because they were getting shopped by like eight different labels, they were able to ask for some money to go in to record demos of what would become the future, you know, the next songs on their next record. So they did that. Um so I remember, and I probably still have one somewhere, of the tape they gave me of songs for the next record. But it wasn't known as Sparkle and Fade or anything. And and I believe it was only four songs. There was a song called uh, Happy Hour, uh, Queen of the Air, which ended up on Sparkle and Fade. Um, I think Heart Spark Dollar Sign, which is a song Art had written for his previous band. So that actually has been recorded. Oh, really? In another band. Yeah, I think so. I think that was... Oof, God, I'm not so great on the. There's there's people that know more about the Everclear history than me, and I was in the band, but um, 
I think that was on his, uh, um, I think he had a band called Easy Hose and I think, um, that was on that. So that it was, it was a slightly reimagined version, but that song had been around for a while. So, and then I don't remember, maybe there was only three, there might've been four. Yeah, shit, there could have been five. I don't know. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a long time to remember. So, but, um, so looking at Sparkle and Fade, I would say maybe half of them were written or at least, uh, yeah, at least sort of written. I'd have to actually go look at the publishing to see who's credited with what. But <laughs> I think um, my, my feeling was is that some of those songs, oh, Heroin Girl, Heroin Girl was on the, um, was on that demo thing. Um, cause I remember, Oh, that's a great song. That's a, this is a great song. And, um, yeah, so that is heroin girl, happy hour, heart spark and queen of the air. So yeah, some of them were, some of them were written. Yeah. But, um, Santa Monica wasn't, um, Summerland wasn't, um, I, I think if I had to guess, I'd say it was probably 50, 50. 50 50 how long yeah. then like after you joined were you guys starting to like you know think of doing sparkle and fade then was did you did you end up touring a little bit for a while with them before you were like okay time to do another record yeah well yeah when we signed with uh, they, because world of noise initially was a local record that was put out by um tk records in portland oregon uh, tim tim kerr records so when they signed to capital i think capital bought the rights to that record for like seven years or something and they were, we released it and because the idea was that we were being signed to them, but everybody knew it was going to take almost a year to write songs, record songs and all of that. So they said, we want you guys to go out and tour. Um, and so we toured behind world of noises, re-release on Capitol records. So we did, well, let's see, I joined in 94, like in the summer of 94 and geez, when did we, we must have recorded sparkle and fade spring or summer of 95 i'm guessing okay so you're in the band for a little bit before you guys recorded that then yeah we did we i'm not thinking about it we did a lot of stuff i remember when we signed with capital and and their promotion people looked at looked at our tour schedule and they were like okay this is great a band that likes to tour because i think that first year we did like 270 shows or something oh my god like something I, I again 25 years on but <laughs> Whatever a lot was, of shows, we, a lot of shows, and we we impressed the promotions people at Capitol. They were like, "Whoa, we've never seen a band that does this." So that first year, um, yeah, we we just played a lot, you know, playing bars and stuff, and and just trying to um, just trying to get the name out. And then Sparkle and Fade, yeah, I think Sparkle and Fade we did in the summer of '95. Boy, you know, I hope this is all correct. <laughs> I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm talking as if I know what I'm talking about, but I think so. I think. Well, when did Sparkle and Fate come out? I think it came out in the fall of 95, didn't it? Yeah, I think yeah, I think you're right. I don't remember the exact month, but fall of 95, I think, would be about right. Okay, so that means we did it in late spring, early summer of 95. So, yeah, there was almost a year of touring before that, yep. And then, you know, kind of, kind of even going away from Everclear for a second, just you personally as a musician, like, what were, like, some of your early drum influences? Who got, who made you want to play the drums? I think the biggest guy for me, when I was learning how to play was my, my biggest band was the police. Oh, nice. So obviously, so obviously the biggest drummer to me was Stuart Copeland. Um, but you know, he, he had such a distinctive style, which I totally copied because I just thought he was awesome. But, um, but you can't make it out in the world playing like Stuart Copeland because only Stuart Copeland can play <laughs> like Stuart Copeland. So, um, but you no, know, in high school, that's who I, I was really into. Um, but also I, as a kid, I'd grown up in London because my dad was in the military. Oh, really? And yeah, so from 78 to 82, like this, from 1978 to 1982, I lived there. And so the reason why I actually played drums is because of Adam and the Ants. I saw Adam and the Ants on TV in London with two drummers, and I thought that was really cool. So I started, I picked up my mom's knitting needles right then and started <laughs> beating on the couch. And all this dust was flying up out of the couch. But, um, <clears throat> that's why I played drums. But when I was in England, you know, um, a lot of the bands that were on, on the radio, like pop radio, not like cool radio, but you know, you would have like the jam right next to ABBA and I loved ABBA too. Um, or the specials or the selector or the English beat. Oh, or, nice. 
Yeah, no, and that was like on regular radio. It wasn't really? on like college radio or cool radio. No, I'm telling you, it was like, you know, they'd play a Dr. Hook song and then they would play like, you know, like a jam song. It was, it, yeah. It's yeah. so rad. Yeah, well, that's how it was. You know, there wasn't the playlists and all the stuff that radio has become or the world's become for that matter. Um, so anyway, I, I really got into to music then, um, just just doing that. And so, uh, but when I first got like my first real drum set, like the police were the were my big influence. And then be, because of growing up in England, I was, <clears throat> and, and because of the police as well, but like I was into like the ska stuff, English beat and specials and selector and, and all of that kind of stuff too. So, um, and then um, after that, you know, gosh, that was in the eighties. So coming into the late eighties, early nineties, um, I was really, I was really into Jane's addiction. So nice. of course, Steve, Stephen Perkins. Um, and then when Nirvana hit, you know, that was, that just exploded. And, um, you know, obviously into Dave Grohl. The, the funny thing is, is I would say that those are my top three drummers and, and two out of three of them uh, went on to write music off the drums. So I always found that really inspiring. Even early on, I was like, you know, as a drummer, you can do other things. You don't have to just be the drummer. Um, so yeah, Stuart Copeland into, uh, writes operas and ballets and stuff now. And of course, Dave Grohl yeah. <laughs> has had more <laughs> Little success. Little band called the Foo Fighters. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, you know, and the funny thing is Dave Grohl went to my rival high school. And so we, we kind of know some of the big same people. And, and actually when, um, things were falling apart with Everclear. Most of our road crew went to the Foo Fighters. So oh, really? I still see that. I, yeah, I still see them. Um, everybody's great guys. And, and I've been to Dave's studio a couple of times and it's, it's really weird because, you know, he, he's got a state of the art recording facility, obviously, but there's a long hallway down one side of it so that you don't have to walk through the studio. If they're recording, you can walk down through the hallway and end up in the back where they store all their gear and stuff. You know, and on one side of this, I would say it's probably 40 yards hallway, maybe maybe 45 yard hallway. It's all Nirvana memorabilia, like old records <laughs> and burnt snare drums and like, you know, all these awards and, and smash guitars. And you're just like, oh, my God, this guy was in the biggest band in the world. And if you turn around and look on the other side, it's 45 yards of Foo Fighter memorabilia. <laughs> and you're just like... This guy's been in the two biggest bands in like the nineties, you know, it's like in two thousands. It's crazy. But he, he Dave's a really sweet guy, absolutely hard to go and, and everybody that knows him is is uh, very complimentary. He's he, he everything he touches turns into gold, but he's just a really de really decent guy. And it's not you know, that's true talent when that happens. I, I'd say it's true talent too. The fact that you can pull that off twice. I mean, not met, you can get commercial success once, but to do it in two separate bands that, and to jump too from going from being the drummer yeah. to the front man like that, it mm -hmm. is insane. You know, I it, mean. it really is. It really is. And they are the pinnacle. Uh, they're the pinnacle American stadium rock band. And I don't think anyone does it better than them. No, and I, I'm not a big, not. I, I'm not a big stadium rock guy. I, I that's, that sounds horrible to me. Go stand in a stadium <laughs> for like five hours, but I have seen them on a couple of occasions just because I go see my friends and stuff. And, um, no one does it better except maybe, I mean, I don't even know that they do it better, but I would say that they're on the same level would be like green day. Yeah. Green day but, is green day is a great live show. Yeah. And, and they, and it fits within a stadium of people, you know, it's not all, every band can do that. Um, not just because of the song catalog, but some, some bands just don't have the energy or the sound coming off the stage that can drive a space that big, you know? So, um, those, they do it and they do it well. Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, kind of getting back then to sparkle and fade, we'll jump back to that when it came time to record it, then, um, I mean, like you said, you had some songs floating around that ended up being on sparkle and fade. Did you guys go in basically then having everything you needed and you were pretty prepared or, I mean, did you get to the studio and then start writing like the other half of it? No, because back then, you know, <clears throat> the studio was, was was so expensive and we were in a, an unknown band. I mean, we had a budget to go in and record it, but, we, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So we <clears throat> went and Art had just we had just gotten enough money getting signed that um, Art was a, Art had a family, he had a wife and a child. So for the first time in his life, he was able to rent like a house, not an apartment. And so because in Portland, all the houses have basements, which is, and the Northwest, which is how that 
Seattle, Portland, Northwest scene explode. It's because everyone just drinks beer down in their basement. <laughs> you got and, basements uh, and rain. Yeah. And so everyone drinks beer and starts bands just so they can be out of the rain. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, so Art rented like a, a small house, like a two bedroom house. And in the basement, um, during the day we would go in and, he would play us the song, the new song she had written, and we we would work them up as a band. So, to answer your question, by the time we went to the studio, they were they were pretty they were done. And um, the, having said that, we went to Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin, which <clears throat> I mean, it was the first real recording studio I had been in. I'd done a couple recordings, but they were usually on where someone brought in a mobile recording unit into a warehouse or something i'd never actually been in the designated studio um but you know it was tiny but at the time it seemed so big time i mean we it was you know and then we ended up recording in much bigger more famous fancier and way more expensive studios later but it was it was still pretty thrilling to be in smart studio which you know which is where like smashing pumpkins had recorded <clears throat> and nirvana had done <clears throat> some of their stuff uh pre um Never mind in there. Oh, and, you know, really? it was Butch, yeah, oh yeah, it was Butch Vig's studio. I mean, oh, it's Butch actually, Vig's studio. Would, I didn't realize that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smart Studios, and, and and I was just talking to somebody. I don't remember. Literally this week, I was talking to someone about it. And the studio is no longer there, but where there was a the the big room, the big recording room, which looking around is about the size of the room I'm standing in in my basement right now, but. Um, uh, was downstairs and then the smaller room was upstairs and i remember when we were rec- we were only there for two weeks so we had to get everything recorded in two weeks um but upstairs they hit butch and the other guy two other producer friends of his were just beginning to write and record the first garbage record oh wow so so they were up there doing that so anytime we walked out of our room they had the music so loud up there that we would just hear this thumping going on up there of, of whatever they were concocting. And, and they were doing it. They were literally recording like one beat at a time. And we were, rec- we were recording like all the songs, like one or two takes, like just like we were trying to get, what is it? 12, 14 songs in two weeks or whatever. Um, they were being really precision based and we were just trying <laughs> to get it done <laughs> downstairs. But yeah. Anyway. And who ended up producing that record actually? Um, Art produced all the records, uh, but the guy that that engineered it was a guy named Mike Douglas, who had maybe done a couple little bands, or I shouldn't say little, but <clears throat> I think he was pretty excited to be on a major label project, and he may have gone on to do other things after that. He was a great guy, but I, I lost contact with him, I lost touch with him. And overall, I mean, the recording of that record, did it go fairly smooth or is that stressful? I mean, it sounds like, too, like you were saying, you went in pretty prepared because, yeah, two weeks doesn't give you tons of time. I would I would say you would definitely probably have a little crunch time in there then. Yeah, I mean, two weeks is just barely doable if you know what you're doing because, you know, you got to load in. It takes one day to load in and sort of get everything set up and then almost a half another day to get sounds on through the mics and everything. So, you know... Um, and then the other thing was that this was all done to tape. There was no sort of pro tools then. So um, you had to actually do it. You had to get it down. <laughs> yeah, you actually have to be able to play your instrument. <laughs> yeah, you had to be able to do that. And um, the other thing that was interesting about it was that, uh, well, maybe it's not interesting to, to some people, but to musicians and stuff, uh, rather than have the click go, art was always like, I like things when they speed up a little bit or, you know, that excitement, but not too much. But so what we ended up doing was when we would start a song through our headphones, they'd bring in the click track. Um, and then once we started the song, they would fade the click track out. So we always started the song at the same tempo. And then if if we were feeling it and it needed to speed up or something, it would do that that's, sort of organic. That's interesting. Thing. That's actually really, yeah. that's cool. I've never heard anyone do something like that. I, I like yeah, that. Yeah, because... Mo- most bands usually, if they're going to use a click, want the click all the way through so yeah. they can all stay locked. Um, but yeah, we did it that way. Lucky, luckily, my times up was pretty good, so <laughs> it didn't. You know, it can be bad if you're really speeding up, but there's a certain excitement I think because we were moving around a little bit. But but really, what it stops is that you know the first take you would take the song at the right tempo, 
And if you didn't have the click to start you again, then, you know, you're feeling good. You're amped up. So I, the drummer counts it off faster on the second take. Right. And then by the third take, you're getting really fast. Cause you're like, yeah, this is awesome. We're rocking. The click track always brought us back to the right tempo of the song at the beginning. And then the, then Mike would fade it out as we got into it. So, yeah. That is, that is, that's really interesting. As far as, as far as too, I didn't realize that, uh, Art was producing those. I mean, how was that having a band member producing? I always wonder that. Like, is it hard to take direction when it's like the you know I'm in the band with this guy? Is it is it a little weird when they kind of take on that role at all? Um, I think it got harder as time went on, but for Sparkle and Fade, everything was so new to me, and Art seemed so much more experienced because he had recorded records before, and he had been in recording studios before. Um. And the other thing is, I think it's easier to take when, when they're his songs. Um, oh, that's because, true. He kind of has you know that I mean? vision, yeah. Yeah, he has the vision, and so uh, it's a lot easier. If he has something to say, you're going to listen to it, I think, just because you know he wrote the song. Now, if he was producing a song that I wrote, that would be a different dynamic <laughs> if he was trying to tell me something else, you know. Um, but no, I mean, it really... And he and Craig had been together for two years before I joined the band. So I definitely felt like the new guys. So I was just trying to keep my head low and just, you know, not screw anything up in terms of, you know, trying to get the drum stuff down really fast. So so that I think almost every song was was one or two, maybe three takes if something fell apart or someone dropped something or something. And then we would move on. So we, we you know, we were getting two or three songs a day. And then had a couple of days for Art to to lead to lay lead vocal, and then <clears throat> you know second or third guitars, <clears throat> and then then we were done. So it was it was in and out, you know. And later with other Everclear records, it would take months. They would just take <laughs> forever. And then you know that by then Pro Tools was there, so you could record as many tracks as you wanted, and you could as many ideas as you wanted. And then you, but then you'd have to sit through those ideas later. You know, like the great thing about Spargo and Fade is, is that um, for me anyway, and I put it, I have, I have a, you know, I have it on vinyl. And when I, I always once a year, put it on and listen to it. And I'm always like, that's a damn good rock record. Yes, it that's is really, really good. And I think a lot of it, I mean, I think not having it to a pro tool click and where everything's, digitally chopped up and everything I, it has a real sense of excitement to it so i'm always pleasantly surprised when i put it on that that it sounds really good and and i go yeah okay that's me playing live drums right there you know it's 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 rewarding there is that charm and i think like i'm sure at the time recording a record in such short amount of time everything is stressful but i do think sometimes it ends up coming out with things like that because you don't have time you don't have time to overthink anything you really don't have the time for that. You kind of go in, you put it out fast in a, you know, in a way. And I think that urgency does show, I think that album and a lot of other albums that you end up finding out were recorded like that definitely do have like an energy to them, you know? So yeah. I do think that's interesting. And actually the pro tools thing, just jumping ahead for a second, um, like with the click and paste thing, I'm, I'm, and I'm drawing the blank right now, but the instrumental on uh, Afterglow, wasn't that, like, you guys kind of did that, right? That was kind of like that, where you took clips <clears throat> and things like that and, oh, like, pasted it was, together. Yeah, no, that was that was totally that. What is that? Um, I'm sort of Delia Melodica or whatever. Yes. Yeah, some silly title. <laughs> um, that was, by Afterglow, Pro Tools was making an appearance, but it was still really kind of clunky and awkward to work with in terms of, in terms of, like, really piecing stuff together but um we had a great a great guy actually he's he's still a good friend of mine um who was always kind of into computers and he'd gotten into to that stuff so that song initially we just we just went out and jammed for like 15 minutes i mean meaning we didn't stop playing for like 15 minutes and just they art and that guy went and went through and said, Oh, that part's cool. Let's grab that part and put this part there, put that, put that part there. And <clears throat> that was probably, it was definitely the first time we'd ever worked like that. It might even be the last time because we didn't use pro tools in that sort of creation editing way. Um, it was more about fixing things more than 
than creating. So the funny thing about that song is that it was actually nominated for a Grammy. So that's the one song that we actually got. Not, it's not even a song. It's an instrumental that got nominated for a Grammy for best instrumental. And really? that year we were up. Yeah, we were up against like I, we went to the Grammys. But oh, nice. We, but it was like Chick Corea. Like uh, you know, like all the heavy jazz guys that we were not with them. So it was like we knew there was no, you know, like Al Di Miola, I don't know, like Herbie Hancock, like it was crazy, like real, real musicians, and we were sitting there with our little cut and paste song. <laughs> You know, but, in a way, though, may they deserve it, because as you're saying that, I'm starting to think about it. Those early days of Pro Tools, that shit was not easy. Like, that stuff was so clunky and whatnot that it it's kind of a skill in itself for it to work, I think. Talking to a lot of people oh, from back then, all they talk about is how much it crashed and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Oh, compared to what it is now. Well, not just pro- – I mean, the computer processing capability now is just ridiculous compared to that. And the guy, the guy that, that did that with us um, – he he went on to become one of the top probably two pro tool editors in the world so he, he stuck with it and and he's he's on first call with every major producer uh and they they take him they send huge major acts to him that he's not ever allowed to talk about no one can know <laughs> that these people i mean world famous singers that are like pro tune or pro tool and tuned and stuff he, yeah it's like he, he can't boast about anything that he does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it's funny. All su- it's all super top secret. That is cool. And also, yeah, it's kind of sad that you can't gloat. But, uh, you know, yeah. gi- given the era of Sparkle and Fade when it came out back in 95, and you guys were on a major label, was the label pushy at all about, like, the directions of songs or anything like that? Were they were like, it has to be more, gr- you know, we want you more grunge or we want this or that? Or were they pretty hands off? Um, I think both. I think both. I mean, that's what you sort of want from a label. You want, you want their input, but then if it's something that you really believe, don't believe in what they're saying, or if you really believe in yourself that you should be able to do that too. And I think it was a little bit of both. Also art came into that because he had more experience with labels and, and also had more of a vision of what he wanted to do. He was more of a tour de force that way. So our and our guy was also very experienced too and had a long history um he wasn't new to the industry so he also wasn't new to you know to artists pushing back and he wasn't new to kicking artists ass and saying no this is the way it's going to be so it was kind of a good give and take so um you know that that's sort of the way that worked the only thing that i remember really that that the label was adamant about is that for santa monica um you know the thing about santa monica is that it's never actually Santa Monica is not mentioned in the song. There's no, it's called Santa Monica. I never thought of that. (laughs) So the labels like your single that you guys want to put out is called Santa Monica, but it never says that. And we're like, yeah, okay. (laughs) But yeah, but what they said was, or what the A&R guy said um, was, uh, it's a great song. It's too short. We need another chorus. And nowadays, that would literally be four Pro Tool clicks, and you could do that. <laughs> a little copy and paste. Yeah, copy and paste, and then crossfade it, and then you're in. Um, but back then, we booked, we had to book a whole nother, the record was done, but it hadn't come out, obviously. We booked time at A&M Studios in Los Angeles, and went in for the sole purpose of re-recording <laughs> Santa Monica with an extra chorus. All for an extra chorus. All for an extra wow. course. And um, because they said it wasn't long enough. And it's a pretty short song, but um, it's a pretty short song now, but it was shorter then. But the problem we had was we couldn't get the sounds didn't sound as good. So we set all the mics up and, you know, recorded the, the new version of the song. And it just didn't sound as good as the original one. So they ended up, and I'll, I, it's funny, I was just talking to someone about this two weeks ago. They ended up cutting the actual tape, the master tape, duplicating it and then putting it back and taping it back together. So if you listen to it now, in the three quarters of the way through the song, there's like a big snare roll, but it's kind of like there's a slight flutter at the beginning of my snare roll. That's the edit. That's where they cut the tape. Oh, wow. Duplicated it. 
and then ran it again. So they, they were doing what Pro Tools would do with four clicks, but they just did it on It's analog, inch. analog copy and paste. Yeah, and I remember <laughs> looking at the sound, and the, the, the engineer, you know, this was done all the time, but I remember the engineer going, well, we'll just I'll just cut it, and we'll, we'll duplicate it and slice it back. And I remember I watched him cut that thing on the razor blade, and I was like, that is our major label debut. <laughs> like, I was freaking, and he's like, don't worry about it. And he's like, and he's spooling this thing, and it's falling on the floor and all this stuff. And then he marked <laughs> it and then did all this stuff. And it took about an hour, but that's that's what was there. So that's actually, it's funny. I, I would love to hear, I'm sure Capital's got it in a vault somewhere, but I would love to hear sort of the sessions that didn't that we were trying to do there that didn't sound as good. So. You know, it kind of goes into my next question. I was going to say, like, as far as what you guys recorded during that Sparkle and Fade sessions, I mean, are there any like B sides or unreleased things I've never seen the light of day, or is it just mostly like demos? Oof, that's a long time ago. I don't think there was much fluff, but I do think I do think we recorded that song Happy Hour that didn't make the cut. Oh, I think I've heard one. live versions of that. There's live versions, and I think there's I've heard probably some studio version of that. It was dropped, and actually, there's probably not very many live versions because we didn't play it very much back in, in the early days. But I, you know, again, there's people that have more stuff than I've got, so somebody has it somewhere. Um, but there was a there was a demo version of it that that, that I told you about. But but there was a sparkle and as, as I remember it, there was a sparkle and fade session where we did it. But um, yeah, it didn't make the cut for some reason. And then, you know, listening back to, uh, including on Sparkle and Fade, I mean, the, you guys have some really good influences on those first, well, I mean, the whole band all together, but I think some of the uh, influences you can hear on the first couple records, I mean, I hear things like Who's Do, The Replacements, different things like that. I mean, are those, is that a fair assessment? You guys are kind of into like the punk and college rock of the 80s. Is that kind of like something you all listen to or are influenced by at all? Yeah, um, what's funny about your question is that those bands were not a big deal to me. No. And I know, and I know Craig, I mean, I, I knew of them, but they weren't like my bands. Um, and I know Craig was really into like butt rock or heavy metal or whatever. <laughs> so I don't, I, I, I don't remember him really talking about those bands or whether he did listen to them or not, but he was more into like ACDC and motorhead and stuff like that. Um, I think art was probably old enough to have, you know, have listened to those bands when they were the, when they were, there but he was you know i don't know that's more a question for art i just know that he being living in los angeles was more of a west coast guy so i know like x was like his biggest band like that's the band he always talked about and and seeing them in la um so you know i'm sure he probably listened to who's screwed you i'm sure he probably listened to the replacements but i don't i wouldn't say that those were formative bands what to were, the experience, to the experience of Sparkle and Fade, and what, Art was also a, hu a huge country guy too, so he, you know, he loved all the early country stuff. So that's why a lot of his songs, um, especially early on, before they became huge production studio productions and stuff, um, can almost work on a, on a country setting. And I mean, what what would be those some uh, maybe some bands that like the three of you could agree on? Like, were there were there any like mutual ones? Like in a van ride, you could all go, okay, we all like this band. We can all we can all kind of agree on this one. Well, I, I, the, the easiest answer to that is that very first tour where I was listening on the the Walkman trying to learn their songs as we went out. That first couple months of touring with them, there was, you know. Um, cd players were kind of a new thing in the in the cars you know and and when we when we got signed we bought a brand new van you know like ooh, <laughs> we got a brand new passenger van and, and it had a cd you know no tour buses or anything we were in a brand new van still driving but the um but it had a cd player which was kind of a big deal at the time and so uh for the first three four six months maybe i don't know definitely my earliest memories of being in the, the those early tours we only had two cds in the van one was green bay's dookie and the other one was the muffs the oh, muffs nice both we great just records oh yeah and back and forth and back and forth we listened to <laughs> each one and green day you know at the time that we were amazed by the production of that i think rob cavallo did both uh 
Yeah, I think you're records. right. I think you're right. He yeah. did. Yeah. So we were trying to, I know Art was really trying to think about, and he may have taken a meeting with Rob to, to maybe produce Sparkle and Fade or, or not. Even Art was always going to produce it, which is probably why Rob didn't want to do it because he didn't want to be an engineer because he was already producing Green Day in the must. <laughs> but, um, but we were just blown away by how good they sounded. And then as Green Day really blew up during that time, we were always wondering why the muffs, who we thought were just as good, weren't blowing up in the same way. You know, because Kim's songs were so catchy, so amazing. Um, but yeah, that's all we listened back and forth. And the, there was all, there was a, there was, we, we, God, we drove so much. We used to have a, a police um, radar detector thing in the, in the van. <laughs> Right. And it would always, it had a, it's, it would, you know, when it would go off, it'd go, boo, you know, and so you'd slow down. But there was one track on that Muffs record where Kim would step on her distortion pedal and it would feed <laughs> it sounded back like it. Exactly <laughs> like it. And, and we listened to them probably 500 times. And every time whoever was driving would slam on the brakes every time her guitar went, boo. Oh, that is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a knee jerk thing. We would be like, literally, when the song would start, we're like, "Don't hit the brakes when the guitar comes in." And then, you, sure enough, whoever was driving, Doop! oh, that that the is brakes. great. Those are two great records. I mean, I, if you're gonna sit there with yeah, just CDs and not have much, those aren't bad records to listen to uh, front to back over and over again. And I, I gotta agree oh. with you too with the whole thing. It is. I'm surprised the Muffs never got as big. There's a couple other bands from that era, a lot of like lookout pop punk bands who came from the same like scene as Green Day that, yeah, I was surprised albums just never got as big as Dookie, but you know, for whatever reason, no, I guess. Yeah, I don't, I don't, well, I mean, Green Day's, they're, they're good. Oh yeah. Oh <laughs> no, you are right about that. I mean, the song, Dookie's a great record, but. Uh, but it was also, but it was also a time, you know, post Nirvana where, where those bands could get the time of day where, where the major labels were signing those bands and putting and, and signing us for that matter um you know four years before that they would have just been sort of indie darlings or whatever you know so it was it was kind of like the whole thing was exploding uh, that's that that's definitely true that uh like what would it be like 1994 yeah 94 into 95 and then yeah i mean it was it was the the the, the doors in nirvana and and those bands kicked open you know, we all came through. <laughs> I'm always interested in hearing. That. I'm I'm 27, so like I missed when like most of that you know happened. I'm always oh interested my. in like hearing that stuff. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, well, it's a little bit weird because I love watching like music documentaries. I'll watch any documentary. I don't care who the band is. I just like to watch them. Like I I actually thought the Grateful Dead documentary was really great, but and I cannot stand the Grateful I mean, Dead. But I, I watched, hate the Dead. <laughs> I do too, but I watched all six installments of it. Um, but just a lot of times, sometimes it's, it's usually, I don't know, like like New York scene in the 70s, you get all these old codgers that are like, wow, we did it. <laughs> and I'm always like, I was like, wow, God, you guys are so self-important. And oh, isn't it nice that you get to sit here? And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I'm getting to the age where people are saying, hey, let's talk about the 25th anniversary. <laughs> well, back then we did this and we did that and there was no Pro Tools. And, we did, you know, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm old now. I'm really old. I shouldn't be doing this stuff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I gotta no. be careful. <laughs> gotta be careful so I don't look like the people that I was making fun of. As, as Sparkling Fade came out, you guys start, started touring off the album I mean, were you like, how soon was it, was it becoming successful for you? Like when you were touring, how long did it take when you started maybe seeing like more people showing up to the shows or maybe started getting like radio airplay? Uh, I think that's what it was. It was radio airplay. Um, you know, heroin girl was the first single off of it and that did well at like college radio. Um, so we were starting to, and we went and did things like uh, CMJ in New York. Do they even still have CMJ in New York? I, I think so. The CMJ Showcase. I, yeah. I, I think they yeah. still do that. That that was a huge deal because all of these little bands like us that were trying to get attention, you know, came up through college radio because they were the ones playing the cool stuff that no one knew about. And so CMJ was a big deal. When we went and played CMJ, that was awesome. We, we shared the stage with uh, uh, the Dam Builders. Have you ever heard of the Dam Builders? That's no, I'm not. Okay, well then, the, they were kind of unusual because they had a woman violin player in them. They had really catchy songs, but you just didn't see a violin player usually in alternative music. Yeah. But she then, um, 
became after the dam builders broke up she became uh, and i'm gonna say it, is what is it uh i'm sure people listening know better than I, is it jonas as policewoman jo- oh. jo- jonah she became like a really incredible solo artist um songwriter um but we played the stage with them and, and it was like it was a big deal it was new york was filled with well, now I guess you would call them hipsters or whatever, but it was filled <laughs> with it was filled with alternate kids and people in college radio and the major labels were coming to check out bands that they might want to sign. And you know, you could launch a career out of CMJ. We had already been signed, but we basically launched our radio career out of CMJ um, <clears throat> by you know getting stations to want to play Heroin Girl, and then Santa Monica came out, and then pretty much after Santa Monica, that's that was the huge that was that was pretty apparent. Once that hit MTV, I mean, radio was a big thing too. But once you got something on MTV like that, oh yeah, back then too, that that was huge. That was huge. And Heroin Girl had been on MTV like on 120 minutes or something, you know, like or late at night or something. But Santa Monica hit and was lucky enough to get into like heavy rotation, and and then that's when things sort of really took off. But uh, back in this was it was it that winter of 95 may no it was probably early 96 it was cold i remember we were playing cold places that we played and no doubt opened for us on that tour because they had just had just a girl had just come out and we we played a memorial coliseum or something which wasn't that sounds like a huge hockey arena but it wasn't but it was it was maybe like a 3000 seat 4000 maybe 5000 seat if you included the floor old memorial hall from like the 30s or 40s or something and i remember looking out the, there was a window in the dressing room that looked out towards the street and i remember looking out the window and watching guys in like the the hazmat vests or you know like the neon vests yeah. with like wands lighted wands waving people in and telling them where to park and it, i was like oh my god we've made it like because up until then, people just showed up and went to the whatever bar or club we were or theater we were playing. But the fact that they had a designated parking area and people were paying to park to come see us, I was like, "This is it. That is, we've made it. it, it we can't get any bigger than this." Of course, we did. But in my mind, in my little <laughs> mind, I was like, "If people are paying to park, then then we've we've done it." It seemed like it, it seemed like a concert, like a you know the concerts I used to go to, you know with all these people would drive up, you know, it, it wasn't just going to a, to a bar or a big club or something. It was, that was pretty exciting to me. I mean, the, did the success like surprise you guys? Like when you were writing sparkle and fade, I mean, I, you know, obviously everyone wants success and you're signing the major label, but I mean, did you have your, were your expectations fairly low on what you guys were going to do? Or are you always like, you know, we want to become I mean, basically huge, you know, we want to be able to play arenas and sell out places like that. Um, Art probably felt that way. I didn't even know what that meant. I was just sort of, I, you know, I was so happy and excited to be able to get paid to do this. You know, meaning that I, I had an apart, I had an apartment in Portland that I was never in, but you know, it was paid for. Because uh, during that that year, we were gone ten months out of the year or something like that. We wow, you guys toured a lot. A lot, a lot, <laughs> lot, lot. Lot, 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 lot. Um, I would come home and my friends, you know, had started new relationships, had beautiful relationships and then broken up with people all before I came home. So I would come <laughs> home and, you know, I was missing huge chunks of my friends' lives because I was you know, I was just gone four months at a time. You know, it was that's just how it happened. But I would say I would never envision playing stadiums and stuff. I didn't even know what that meant. I had no idea what that meant. It just was like the, each time we would roll through a town, we would play. If we were playing a bar, we would have more people the second time in the bar. And then we would, the next time we come through, we play a club. And then the next time we'd sell out the club. And then the next time we'd play a theater. So it was, it was like baby steps so much. So that like when, when I talk to people and, and they're like, Oh my God, what was it like to play? Madison Square Garden or what was it like to play Woodstock the funny thing about that is that if you literally got signed and the next day you played Madison Square Garden you would be freaking out like you'd have no frame of reference for it but because we'd taken 
six or seven years of baby steps to that point. It's weird to say it. And I find it's weird to even when I say it, I'm like, God, that sounds so stupid, but it literally was another day. <laughs> you, you, I remember when, when we did Woodstock, we were like, Oh, Woodstock, Woodstock, you know, for the whole week leading up to it, Woodstock 99, the whole week, we're gonna, yeah, wow, this is going to be amazing. But when we walked out on stage, Woodstock was the same kind of everything <laughs> else. And Madison Square Garden, Madison Square Garden, Madison Square Garden. And then you get there and it's like, yeah, it's, the stage is the same size as the night before, you know? It was, so, um, and that's weird to tell people because they're like, no, no, I couldn't even imagine. And, and I couldn't either, except that, you know, we had baby stepped to get to that point. So it wasn't, it wasn't that big of a shock. That makes sense. You know what, though? It does kind of make sense because, like you were saying, you're like, I mean, you're touring your asses off like that where I could see that where, I mean, you're kind of putting your head down and you keep playing and just, you know, keep soldiering through doing it. And, you know, you keep seeing it pay off and it gets a little bigger, gets a little bigger. And, you know, I, yeah. I think you're totally right where, yeah, if, you know, if you joined Everclear, signed signed to Capital, and then two days later were, you know, playing Madison Square Garden, that might be a little different. That may be a little oh. more like, oh, my God. I know. would have had a heart attack. <laughs> I totally had a heart attack. Yeah, um, but it, but it wasn't that way. I joined Everclear. We drove all the way across country and we played to two people in New York City. My first show. <laughs> so that that's really it can only go up from there. And actually, on that tour, we actually played somewhere in Georgia. I want to say Savannah, but that may not be right. Um, where we opened up on that same tour, my first tour with them, we, we opened up for a heavy metal cover band. <laughs> And in Georgia, and so I, I had, we had to sit there and watch them set up the four kick drums, <laughs> and like you know it was like crazy. And then we had to set up in front of them. But the funny thing was is that when we started, no one was there except for the security guard and the bartender. And after our first song, the security guard went outside, and after the second <laughs> song, the bartender hopped over the bar and walked <laughs> outside. So we literally were playing to no one. And I remember Art turning around and saying. Should we just, should we pack up or should we, you know, play the show? And because I was so brand new and was still sort of a little bit unsure of some of the songs, we played the show just so I could have more practice playing the song to nobody. <laughs> Became yeah. a rehearsal. It was a rehearsal. Yeah, that's exactly. That's cool though. I mean that and see, but like that to me, it kind of makes sense. Then what you're saying with trajectory, you know, kind of, kind of going from there, you know, only going up, which obviously a great thing. And then, you know, after Sparkle and Fade came out, you guys had some success with that. And, uh, you know, when it was time to go do so much for the Afterglow, you know, was the label more pressuring on, you know, singles being more radio friendly and whatnot? Did that did that become more of a thing once, you know, you got some some airplay from uh, Santa Monica? I'm I'm sure they wanted that. I But again, I think it, I think it, the, the direction for us came more from art because now now he had had a song and the big fear now was that we were just going to become one hit wonders. So I think he put more pressure on himself than the label did to come up with a radio friendly um, album. I think he really, really wanted to cement himself as, as being valid. And, and of course the label wanted as many hit singles as they could get. And they ended up getting a bunch, but, um, I think most of, most of the pressure was was Art putting the pressure on himself to come up with those songs. And then, I mean, like like for me personally, and I, I was I was trying to figure this out. Like, you know, you you guys you guys definitely got success on Sparkle and Fade. I mean, a- Afterglow obviously sold even more. Like, what was the change? Like, like in between when you guys once Santa Monica came out, like were you playing about theaters at that time? And then, and then like kind of it got bigger after like afterglow. I'm just trying to like figure that out in my own mind. Like, you know, I guess kind of where you were in between of sparkle and fade and so much for the afterglow, like I guess success wise, like how big of places you were playing. Uh, but that's, it's tough to remember back then because my biggest memory of touring behind sparkle and fade and it, and it wasn't cause we toured the whole year, like I was saying 10 months or whatever, but the, the big memory that I have is that summer of 96, we are put together a package tour. And so we were playing sort of outdoor sheds or, you know, you know, sheds, right. Uh, or amphitheaters. Oh yeah. 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 But, but it was, but it was us with like space hog and Tracy Bonham and stuff. So we were the headliner, but having those other bands helped 
So I don't know. I don't know if we could have played those places by ourselves. Is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, it was Tracy Bonham, Space Hawk. Uh, oh God, there was another band in there too. I can't remember right now. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was just those. Um, but I would I would say we were probably playing theaters, playing and selling out theaters in that time period there. Um, yeah, but Afterglow was Afterglow was kind of a different beast. The one thing about Afterglow is that um, uh, when we are, had written songs or had written most of the songs or had ideas or whatever, and we were going to reconvene and like jam them out like we did before. And Creed got really sick with like shingles or something and was hospitalized with pneumonia. I can't remember. He was actually in the hospital and wasn't there. So Art played me like, I think it was, um, it was either everything to everyone. I think it was father of mine, actually. I can't remember which one was first, but it had a little bit of a, a thing to it. And I, and I said to him, I said, I, when I would make little recordings at home, I had a certain beat that I would do at home. And then I would overlay another beat with brushes on top of it. And it was kind of this little beat. And I said, Hey, Art, I have a perfect beat for that. And we did it. And it, the reason why I can't remember whether it was everything, everyone or father of mine is because it's the same beat on both songs. I was like, I was like, that's great. That's an amazing beat. Like, yeah. Okay. And then he's like, I've got another song. Jang, 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 jang. And I was like, Oh, well, the beat will work on that one. And then he's like, I've got a third song. It goes, jang, 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 jang. And now if, if you listen to afterglow, actually what I should say is if you listen to every radio single on afterglow, it's the same beat on every song. <laughs> And and I'll say this: if you listen to every Everclear single after that on every other one, it's the same beat because suddenly Art just started writing every song like that. So, and if you li- so if, if you listen to Spark on Fade, it's way more of a straight up rock record because I didn't write the dr- half the drum beats on it, and those songs weren't they were half of them were written before, and they were more in the vein of like an X or something that was you know it was a little bit more just choppy rock. But once I showed him this beat, it was like, a, to this day, I remember to this day later when we were playing places like Woodstock and stuff, you know, on the side of the stage would be all these people watching all the performance. And I just remember thinking, I played the same beat for four songs in a row now. They just must, this is so embarrassing when you look over and Travis Barker and you know, all these other drummers are up there and I'm playing the same freaking beat for half the show but it worked you know that was the thing um it, it obviously it did i mean that that beat definitely worked i would say yeah you know. everything to everyone father of mine like i i made there may be one that didn't have the beat but i'm telling you <laughs> down through the radio signals, i'm playing the exact same thing the exact same thing almost all the way through and sometimes i would try to get art you know i would i was always i was always into making different sounds and stuff so I would put things on my drums or I, I, I would create weird things like put car keys on a snare drum or put chains on a cymbal or something. And I was always into a, a lot of different music. So I was always kind of, I wasn't, I, I wasn't as much of a rock and roll guy as Craig and Art were. I, I mean, I did like rock and roll, but I was also listening to like Cuban music and other stuff. So I would sometimes bust these beats out that were really cool and really different. And Art would be like, I love that. We got to do that. Let's do that on the, on the next record or I, hey, for the next song. But can you, can you just change that one beat there? And I go, yeah, yeah. Change it. And he goes, okay, well that, okay. Now can you change that, the kick drum pattern right there? And I was like, yeah, okay. And, he would do that until we got back to the, to the single beat. <laughs> and that would be, goddamn beat. I was like, God, here we are again, man. I was trying to do something cool. He's like, no, that's perfect. What you play now is perfect. And I'm like, yep, I know. <laughs> Same beat for every song we've done. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. That, that, is, that is so funny. So, yeah. you know, being in a band, I mean, as we're speaking of radio hits right now, I mean, you guys have tons and tons of them. I'm sure that whether or not you like hearing Everclear songs, I'm sure you hear them where, you know, you hear them in different places, whether it's a radio or you're in public somewhere. But like, do you ever, I know, I know we mentioned earlier, you do listen to Sparkle and Fade from time to time. Do you listen to like anything else from Everclear, like willingly per se at all? Like, do you ever go back and listen to any of that? I... I'll hit a moment of nostalgia and I'll go back. That's usually when I go back and play because I have Afterglow and Sparkle and Fade on vinyl and I'll listen to those on vinyl and crank it up on the stereo. Um, 
I usually got to wait till my family's out of the house because they'll just roll their eyes at me. But uh, <laughs> and I think Afterglow is a good record too. Um, as a as a unit, I think after Afterglow, I think all the records that I was involved in, which is like a three more records, I think there's on all those records there's always two or three really good songs, and then that that I think stand up. Um, but I think Sparkle and Fade and Afterglow were, were really complete in their entirety. I, I don't think there's any sort of fluff on those two records. I do think there's some fluff on the other records. And part of that is because Art was also writing to the same beat and just couldn't <laughs> get out of, in my opinion, I mean, I'm sure he thinks of it differently, but he just, I, th- I think it became a little bit of a crutch. And because it was successful, it was real easy to fall back to that. Um, but I think... There's still some songs on those later records. Uh, I don't know if I know Art very well, but I know him better than some people. But there, there's a couple songs that most people probably wouldn't even think about that I think are just are uh, really honest in a way um, that is startling to me when I hear them now, where I was like, oh, wow. At the time, I thought this was just another little song, but really, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think there's there's a couple good songs on each record afterwards. I don't think they all stand up as a complete unit. I I agree with that. I love. I mean, I think I think what you're saying, like, I mean, for me personally, yeah, Sparkle and Fade, perfect. Afterglow, perfect. I mean, that would have been the one that I vaguely remember. I would have been very very young, but I can still probably like four or five or whatever. But I do remember hearing songs and stuff off that. And I do. I think then after that, you guys had some solid songs on the other ones. But there is something about. I would say Sparkle and Fade and Afterglow, there's like just a magic there, including as a trio. I mean, you guys, just the three of you, including on Sparkle and Fade, it just like, like I would, like I doubt you guys would consider yourselves a punk band. I don't think anyone would like say it's a punk record, but it's like in a lot of ways, you are just kind of a loose kind of rock band playing kind of fast tempo songs there. And I yeah. think that's the charm of it. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's the charm that maybe had you had more time, maybe if you had three months to like, write and record sparkle and fade maybe it wouldn't come out the same way you know maybe it wouldn't be as good if it was you know kind of had more time to produce you know like have more production on it per se oh i i totally agree i mean i think that's the big thing is because later on we had bigger budgets and art was able to go all beach boys (laughs) and wanted you know do whatever he wanted to do you know let's bring in inverted violins and you know all that kind of like um and that's fine whatever um but I'll say this, the two weeks, you know, that we got to record Sparkle and Fade seems really fast to me. But you know, my wife grew up in the in the Berkeley scene with with uh, Green Day and and um, Ivy and all those bands. Oh, nice. And I can and I can tell you that two weeks in the studio to them would have <laughs> we were the bloated major label guys because they would go in and record a whole record in one day and mix it you know I, so I, to, to them we were we were sort of out of control um, to us it seemed really short it's all just it's all a matter of perception it's know? funny i was i was interviewing a few months ago uh steve kravik who engineered blink 182's first album and he told me yeah. that they went in there they had a weekend they had two days to record 18 songs and he's just like right. i don't know how the hell you're gonna do it like i don't know how your label thinks this is gonna happen I don't like <laughs> what do you think we're going to do in two days, 18 songs from, you know, a band right. early, you know, that was very early on too. So I mean, not right. a great band, right. but you know, they're kind of starting out there. So yeah, that's, but once again, there's also magic to that. Cause you also can go back and listen to that. And it's like, Oh, that makes sense that that was recorded in such a short time. You can hear that urgency in it, you know, there's Oh, totally. not time to add, you know, hand claps or layer things no. or anything like that, you know, not time to even do another take. No, <laughs> that's true. Like, you don't have time good, to do a second time. No, just good enough. Moving on. So, you know, it's like, okay. So then after, after Everclear, I know you formed the Ulas and we did talk about this a little earlier about your drum influences, you know, kind of jumping and, and doing different things. And I know in there you uh, sing and play guitar in that one. How was that transition for you going, you know, from drummer to front and center? Was that weird at all? Um, well, the thing for me was that when I left Everclear, um, I, I was really fed up with all of it. Like just all of it, I, everything. And, and in a way, and it's, and it was a bit disappointing, but in a way I was fed up with playing drums. Now, not with the act of playing drums themselves, but the drums were a part of that whole nine year experience. So um, I was just kind of burnt out on everything. And 
I thought I had, I'd always wanted to write songs, but I didn't really know how to play guitar and I'd never really learned. And, and so I just, I, I took a little bit of time off and just tried to write songs just to see if I could do it. And, um, the thing was, is that, and I bought, and I bought some studio equipment too, and, um, just sort of started recording and, and the Ulas came about because my brother, my younger brother who had for a time was our bass tech, but, but had left quite a while before, um, was dating this girl. And, um, we sort of all just came together and, and formed the Ulas. And, uh, and so I was teaching myself how to, I, I shouldn't even say I was teaching myself how to play guitar. Cause I, to this day, I don't know how to play guitar and I don't even know, I don't know the names of the strings either. Um, all I know how to do is like the bar chords. Um, it's all you need to know, honestly. Yeah, that's that. Everyone says that, but then, <laughs> I, but anyway, yeah, but in my case, it's true. It's not all I need to know. It's all I do know. So that's, that's, what i do but um but things were coming out great between the three of us and and we all wrote and some of us sometimes it was a song com- you know that I, like i would write a song completely and bring to them and we would just record it or sometimes they would have a song completely done that bring to uh, to me and we would record it or sometimes we mix it up and each contributed and everything and it was just a great experience because it was it was fun again and um and being not on drums again it, it was like where do I plug this cord? Do I plug it into the amp? <laughs> do I plug it? What does standby mean on an amp? Like everything, everything was new again. And that was really exciting to me. And, um, but the funny thing was that the Ulas ended up getting signed. So all of a sudden I was on a signed, uh, well, we were signed to an, to a imprint on a, on a major. And then we got upstreamed into the major. So all of a sudden oh, wow. I was on a major, I was on a major label. We got signed to Island Def Jam. Um, and so, yeah, so here's a guy that doesn't know how to play guitar that's writing songs for a band that got signed. So I, I was on two major labels, which was pretty exciting. But that is cool. The thing is, I again, I don't know how much time you have. This is hey, I this is but, I can. This is good, man. Podcast goes okay. as long as they want. The radio show, we can do a two parter. I can put this on two days. <laughs> this stuff's interesting. I love this, and I swear, people, people, I think are fans. They're interested in this stuff. So no, this okay. is great, man. Okay, well. Because usually, if my kids were here, they would have been rolling their eyes. Oh, I'm loving this. I'm loving this, man. Okay. Well, the 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 story that I have is that right when the Ulas got upstreamed um, into the major label, we we put out our first record on the imprint of the of the major label. But I was in a bar. I lived in L.A. still, and I was in a bar in L.A. and a, a woman sat next to me. She, I got to be careful now because I keep referring to people, you know, being oh, she was a little older, but you know i'm gonna be 50 this year so all of a sudden like you know a little older it's like 52 or something but she sat down and we just started started talking and she was a guitar player and and i was like oh no and she's like what are you doing i go i'm in this band i play guitar too so she was trying to have this guitar conversation with me and i was like we just got signed to island def jam and she's like no way major label and all this stuff i was like yeah but i don't really know what i'm doing i mean i don't you know i'm not a guitar player and and she ended up getting really almost sort of belligerently upset with me because she's like, I've devoted my entire life. Like she went to she went to like Berkeley or Juilliard or something for guitar. Like, I've devoted my entire life to this. And you and I've never been on a label and I've never been signed. And you and you don't know the name of the strings and you're on it, you know, and I was like, Yeah, that's just how it is. Like I cause I and it's even that way on drums. I, I'm I watch the YouTube drum videos of drummers that I can't even fathom what they're I can, I can watch them, but I don't understand how they're able to do things like that. I was not, I'm a decent rock and roll drummer. I'm not, I never wanted to spend my life devoted to the craft of trying to become the best drummer with all the tricks and all that stuff. And, and I knew I was never going to go be in a, in a jazz Cuban Afro <laughs> band, you know? So like all I really wanted to do was to play with people. And so it wasn't about being the best drummer or whatever. So, and that's what I ended up trying to explain to her. I was like, I, I have so much respect for someone that can master anything, uh, basket weaving or cooking or, you know, drums or guitar, like, you know, like her, I have total respect for that because I don't have the attention for it and it doesn't really interest me, but 
the reason why she devoted her life to it and not had success. I mean, there may be a million reasons, but, um, and uh, me only knowing three chords and was able to get signed is that you have to create something that someone wants to hear. Yes. Ex- yes. You know what I mean? You can be a complete master of your instrument, but if it's just you down in your basement doing paraphilera diddles and, and <laughs> stuff like that, like no one's going to care. Um, so for me, it was more about getting out and playing with people and creating the, uh, art together it was more collaborative um so anyway yeah but she she got really upset with me (laughs) and i was like yeah i'm sorry i don't know um did you let her know you had that was your second as well that it was not your first either that's your second yeah no i know uh yeah and then she got she started getting so upset that i started not really bringing up all that stuff anymore but it was like (laughs) this could get really ugly i'm gonna actually leave i gotta go somewhere but um so I've, I've been incredibly lucky and in and, and the same way that, um, you know, the thing is, is like, again, going back to my two out of my three drummers, um, I think Dave Grohl's amazing. He actually did learn how to play the guitar, you know? And so maybe that's why he's able to, 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 to be successful, but he's also created, I mean, I don't, I guess I own Foo Fighters records, but that's only because they were on Capitol Records and they would give them to us for free. I'm not sure that I've ever bought a Foo Fighters record. But if I go to their show, every song I know every word to, like without being a fan per se, because they're they're just amazing. And they've been on the radio and he writes hooks and lyrics. And then they as a band put on such a colossal show that, um, you know, they're amazing. And I always found that inspirational. I was, I'm not, obviously able to get to that level i don't have that kind of talent and and there is a talent to writing stadium rock hooks you know um otherwise everyone would do it if they could i guess oh yeah you're Um, totally right yeah but i always wanted to create my stuff so that's what i've always focused on and and i was really lucky to to be successful in doing that so that i was able to do it i haven't had a real job from the age of well when i joined everclear you know like a real day-to-day job. So I was always able to, um, to, to move to the next thing. And so when I left Everclear, it was a real moment of like, Oh no, what am I going to do now? I'm washed up at 33 high school educated, <laughs> you know, and right about that time is all the, my friends who had gone to college were all starting to become successful in their fields at around 33, because, you know, they all had skills to stuff to file back on. I was like, Oh no, what am I going to do? And, and that's when the, that's when the Ula showed up. That's pretty cool. And that was, yeah. And so that was kind of cool. And so that, that, and I just said, well, I'm going to take this, see where this goes. And, you know, we had about five good years on that. And the Ula's record that we put out, Best Stop Pop, is really the thing that I'm most proud of. I mean, Everclear was great, but it was definitely, you know, those were art songs. Um, and the other thing that was fun about the Ula's is that we, we started out again with nothing like, uh, so it was fun to get in a van again after tour buses and semi trucks and all that stuff and drive to a bar in, you know, Albuquerque and um, play for 60 bucks or whatever we got paid that night, 40 bucks, 20 bucks. And, and your two drink tickets each, you know, (laughs) and people are like, Oh my God, this must be so hard for you to do this. And I go, no, this is actually, this is the best. I, I, I love getting back to that. And um, it was fun to start over on your own term. I terms. respect that though. Cause that makes me, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, you see it with other bands too, where I mean, you know, you do, you kind of transition it, you know, you were in a big band like Everclear, but the fact that you can go on and do something like that makes me go, okay, that guy actually cares about the music. Like that guy's doing it cause it's fun. Cause quite frankly, if you had the ego, it wouldn't, you know what I mean? If you had an ego about it, you wouldn't be able to go back to playing dive bars. You're like I, I played in Madison square garden. I can't do this. So that, right. that to me as a fan, like, okay, that guy cares and there's some quality behind it. And also the fact that you said you were 33 then when you started playing guitar, yeah. Yeah. See that to me, I respect the hell out of that. How many people, you know, at that, at that age, people, a lot of times don't go and do that. Like to me, that's very ambitious that, you know, you could, you could jump to something like that. You know, you could leave Everclear, teach yourself something like that. And then once again, you know, you know upon another major label and, you know, having some success with that and whatnot. I mean, I think that's uh, I don't know. I think yeah. that's respectable, you know, that, and that's neat too, as a musician. Yeah. I think, um, well, I've always been, 
incredibly lucky that that whatever whenever something has ended something has been there to jump on and not everyone has that opportunity and i used to have kids come up to me all the time during the everclear days going you know how do i get to do what you get to do and i was always like ah you know they're like my parents say that i got to go to college but you know to have something to fall back on um you know but is that is, is that what you did <laughs> and i would be like um well, the thing I don't know. First of all, I'd say I don't really know what to say because I don't really, I don't think I can give you advice. But the only thing I can that I will say is that what your parents are saying is the smartest thing. <laughs> <laughs> Have something to fall back on because the odds of it happening for for a million different reasons, whether you have a talent or not talent, or what you know, whether you are you know, prone to drug and alcohol or whatever, whatever it may be. <laughs> it's always good to have a backup, but then whatever bands, you know, and then I would point to the other musicians and the other bands and or whoever we were on tour with. And I said, and I'd be like, the thing that the thing is, and I can't tell you what to do. The thing is none of these people on stage have a backup. None of us did. So it's smart to have a backup, but I, mm, I think if you have a backup, you, the drive isn't there. But yeah, having, said that. That, having said that, people have had tremendous drives, no backup, and true talent, and haven't made it. And those people disappear, and you never hear them again. You're coming to me because I'm in this band and that I'm incredibly lucky to, to be in. But all the people that have tried and failed just disappear down by the wayside. So yeah, to that... me, it's, it's a real numbers game. And, and this was when rock and roll and radio and MTV were still around nowadays. I, I'm just like, no, don't, don't <laughs> no, it's a whole different monster now. <laughs> I don't even know what success <laughs> is anymore in the music industry. Um, so, but I don't know. I think the people that make it are usually desperate. Very, very few trust fund kids make it into successful rock bands. I guess it's happened. But um, usually someone has to really have nothing else. Well, you know, it kind of goes like you were saying, too, about the thing of, uh, you know, you can you can basically learn all the music theory in the world. You can know how to play all these chords. You can know your scales and whatnot. But if what you're playing isn't good or like something people want to hear, then it doesn't matter. So it's the same way where like you can have all the money behind you. A, A major label can try to shove something down people's throat as much as they want. And I mean, oh, totally. if it's shit, though, it's only going to go so far. You know, you can throw it in a hundred people's faces, but do those hundred people care? Are they going to go out and buy the album, you know, or anything like that? Like, that's where it comes down to, I mean, luck, but also talent and whatnot. You know, being able to make something that, uh, yeah, you know, people like. I mean, quite quite frankly, people aren't listening to, you know, I mean, like, like we aren't talking about Sparkling Fade 25 years later because yeah, like arts, pl- those scales on there, those solos, or your technical <laughs> yeah. drumming, like you know, no right. one's talking about it for that reason. We're right. talking about them because no. they're good songs, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. That's, and I think, it w- and you know, and that's why the bands like the Ramones and stuff hold up. Yes. Any, any, any one week old guitar playing, learning guitar guy that's only been playing for a week can play Ramones songs, but nobody could sound like the Ramones. Nobody could be them. And, um, but they created something that, that, that was magic that worked, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great example of that. I mean, you know, for people who, yeah, I mean, including when you look at the era that they came out in, you know, with the heavy metal bands and a lot of, you know, technical bands yeah. out there that did have solos and whatnot. And then it's like, yeah, they're four and not even always four chords, sometimes less than that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, and like a minute and a half long songs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, that, uh, kind of going back to your drumming though too um and a couple other things you've done i know <clears throat> on and off you play uh drums with storm large and i mean that's that's a different kind of style as well i mean was that a weird transition for your drumming going from something like Everclear to that um well again that's another case of like when the ulas ended which we didn't really end it's just that um once we got upstreamed into island the uh the music industry tanked. And so basically there was no one to, to take to, there was, it was just a case of the music. Literally they, they gutted the label. So there was no one there to take charge and direct 
bands and what we were, you know. So anyway, we, we got off that label and then, and then because of that and the music industry completely was changing and, and blowing up all over. And I just had my second kid and, and, um, you know, we just sort of just said, now's a good time to just sort of walk away. And it was a, there was no breakup or hard feelings or anything. It's just everyone, we'd given it our best shot and it through no fault of our own, um, didn't work out. So we left. And then that was another time where I was suddenly like college or high school educated. What am I going to do? Only now I'm it's 38. <laughs> <laughs> So now I'm getting, I was old in the Ulas. Like, you know, like people would be like, who's the old guy? You know, I was like, well, I'm, wait, I'm 34. But when the, but when all the hot bands were like 22, you know, 34 is ancient. So, um, so, but now I'm 38. So I, I was really not sure of what I was going to do then. And Storm had been a fan or been a friend for a couple of years. I'd known her for a couple of years and we'd always wanted to work together. And so, she called up and that is a different gig, but it was a perfect gig in my old age because it's kind of quiet and it's not, I don't have to actually the nine years I've been with her right now or 10 years now, I've just been playing quieter and quieter and quieter and quieter because it's, she's a vocalist. You know, it's not about power. It's not about um, show. It's not about excitement. Um, she, she does all that by herself anyway. She's incredible. So my job is more support. And so in my old drumming age, that's been a really good gig to have because it's just it's just me sitting back there. Most nights I don't even break a little bead of sweat or anything. And she's an amazing performer, a true talent. And then the other thing with her is that we get to play <clears throat> concert halls, performing arts centers. You know, we've played the Kennedy Center with her. Um, we've played with the National Symphony Orchestra on the lawn of the Capitol Building, which is oh, weird because... Wow. It's I've had a lot of really unique experiences, but one of the best was hearing my snare drum slap back echo off the <laughs> off the Capitol building in Washington. That's so cool. The sound guy's like, give me some snare drum. And I go quack and it goes whack, quack, 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 quack. And I was like, that's my snare drum bouncing off the Capitol building right there. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And so the, the gig for her has been different because she also uh, – we do her theatrical production. She has a one woman show. So sometimes we're holed up in a theater for a couple of weeks while we do a show, her show. Um, sometimes we're playing jazz clubs when we do the cabaret. And a lot of times we play with symphony orchestras and stuff. So it's, it's always kind of different with her, which is, which has been great. It's, it's, I've been the luckiest dude in the world that I've been able to find these things when they happen. So it's funny. I didn't realize she was uh, like she's playing with Pink Martini. I saw because there's posters of it up like 20 minutes from where I live. And then when I was getting this, you know, we were getting this together. I put two and two together. That was the same, you know, the the person you played drums with that she also does that with Pink Martini. Yeah. Well, when I was, a couple of years after I was with her, um, Pink Martini's main vocalist um, had to have vocal surgery, so she was going to have to be gone for like a year and. Pink Martini had dates booked and stuff. And so they asked Storm to fill in for her and Storm said yes. And then when the lead vocalist was ready to come back, she had just had a child or something in that year off or something that wanted to spend more time at home. So Storm tours sort of half the year with Pink Martini. I don't want to say half the year. It's not like she's gone January to June, but I mean, you know, she, she goes out with them for a couple of weeks and then comes back and then goes out with us for a couple of weeks. And then, so she's kind of doing, doing both and they're both different gigs but and she's amazing at both but um but that allows me some time to be on now nice. too so and this is a per perfect way to go it's kind of jumping back for a second but i did want to ask this and i forgot to like for the ulas the upstreaming i mean was that something because people who don't know that i've heard a lot of bands get upstreamed without choice i mean did you want to be upstreamed or was that kind of a thing that was just put on the band we may have been because the industry literally tanked right after we were upstream. <laughs> we may be the last band to ever be upstream. In the history of <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, in our case, we wanted it. Um, the the woman that signed us initially to the to, to her imprint on Island Def Jam, and we put out the, the record Best Stop Pop. I'm, check it out. It is really, I think it's really good. And when I play it for people, they're like, "You're the best band that I've never heard of before." <laughs> but um, we they only put out like 2000 copies of that record like cuz it was oh, an wow. imprint 
or maybe they did more, but it was, it was definitely not a lot and they're, they're more difficult to come by now. But, um, the idea was to see if we were going to have enough legs or be good enough to, to go on the major label. Cause at this point, the major labels weren't signing really anybody anymore straight out of the, out of the gate. Well, when I say that records I, either at that point, right. And that's kind no, of piracy exactly, and no. all that shit. Oh yeah. I mean, this is post all that stuff. I mean, it literally was like a ghost town. Um, now if you were a pop princess or something, maybe you'd get signed, but if you were like a rock band or something that didn't very rarely did that happen. And so we signed with them and because, you know, I was a bit unsure of us too, because <laughs> I, I could barely play guitar and they could barely play their instruments. And, you know, we recorded the, what we thought was a great record, but it was recorded in my garage. Um, and so, you know, we were fine with that, but the idea was always that we would prove to them and then we'd get upstreamed. And so, um, we did get upstreamed and, uh, Jay-Z was the head of the label at the time. So he had to approve it and he came down to see us and, and so we got upstreamed and then literally when we got upstream, they fired like 300 people at the label. Oh and, shit! And then no one could tell no one was in charge of it. Uh, in terms of, there was no A&R guy. Um, our A&R guy had gotten fired. So you hate it was hearing kind of, things like that. It happens too often. Like your story is like it had that things like that happen too often in the, you know, in the music industry. Well, they do, but, but this was a real, it's not just, they, they've always happened time to time. Um, the industry literally fell apart all on all fronts. Like it's, 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 you know, well, it's a little bit like this virus thing going on. It was unprecedented and no one knew what the deal was, where, what the new model was going to be. No one, you know, it was just everyone running around with their hair on fire going, ah, the music industry's <laughs> collapsed. You know? And, and, and so from that point on 2008, you no know, one, people are like, you know, how do you make it in the I was like, I have no idea. I have no idea. And I gave up trying to quote unquote make it at that point. So now all I try to do is make good art that I like and hopefully someone else will like to listen to it. So I'm not that lady in that bar <laughs> 10 years from now. 10 years from now, you're just fighting people in bars. Right? Just being like, ah, I used to write songs that people like. Nah. You know, but, so- um, but real quick, I just want – but the funny thing about the Ulas too is that, you know, um, just literally before all this sort of virus stuff happened, and which seems like it's been going on forever, but it's just three weeks now. Um, on this last Storm tour, because we've been going 10 years with her, and, and like I said, she's – when she's not with us, she's with Pink Martini. So she's been going 10 years hard. And so we all sort of said, you know, we should maybe take six months or a year off or something and, you know, take a break. And then literally the next week, the world started to end. And so all the dates were canceled anyway. So, but so all of a sudden I was like, oh, okay, well now here I am looking down, you know, a year off. Um, again, high school educated with no real skills. <laughs> and, and, and at that point I'd been reaching out to Ollie from the ULAS for a long time. And she's, she's has a solo project and career going and, and she's always been busy and I've always been busy, but all of a sudden it was suddenly no one was busy. And, um, and my brother was in the band too, but he is now lives in Portland, Oregon and, and owns two like uh, small businesses. So he's just super busy, but we called him up and said, Hey, we're, we're thinking about, you know, doing an, another Ula's record. And he just couldn't be involved just time wise, but he gave us his blessing. And so Ollie and I, she came out here to Minneapolis, uh, right when this was all going crazy like two weeks ago and um and so we started writing again and so <laughs> the idea is that we'll put out a new record who knows how long that would take <laughs> in the modern world now but the great thing is, is that you know we're not on a label and no one cares there's no one being like we need it out by summer so you could do the festival like no one there's none of that um we're just going to record it in our own time in my basement studio here in minneapolis and um but that's been really fun too because it's getting back to being creative. And also, I have a solo record that I literally just received the last mix today. Oh, and nice. So, yeah. So, again, virus pending. Um, <laughs> we'll see how long that takes. It's taken me four years to get it done and to get it mixed. Um, the guy that mixed it mixed the Ulaz record back in 2005. And at the time, he was relatively unknown. Um, now, he actually was Butch Vig's engineer during all of the Foo Fighter 
stuff that Butch Vig did. Oh, and, nice. And anyway, so, but um, he ended up mixing my record, and it's just taken a long time because he's he's kind of big time. And um, well, I don't know. To me, he's big time, but he, you know, that sounds pretty big time. Yeah, when he's when you're when he's mixing your record as a favor, you can't sweat him on how long it's taking. <laughs> you know so and he's been amazing and he's always i don't know if i'd ever have anyone else mix my stuff because everything i write and record is recorded in my garage or my basement and he knows how to make that sound better than it deserves to <laughs> too so that's why the Ulaz record sounds great even though it was done in my garage and my solo record was done in my basement and um so he just sent me the last mix today and the record sounds incredible it's i'm so happy with it i just got to get it mastered and then to you know i'm putting it out on vinyl so oh not oh i love love the uh i love vinyl releases that'll be cool that comes out on there you a vinyl collector yeah, at all i i am but i'm kind of a vinyl collector in the way that i collect drums i don't collect drums to collect drums i collect you drums use them. because i use them because if it's got a cool sound i like it i, I don't need to have a 1936 Ludwig whatever <laughs> snare drum you know um, and I have some drums that are valuable, but they're, um, I never bought them for the value. I just bought them because they were cool and, uh, or had it made a cool sound or looked cool or something. But, um, but that's the way I am with vinyl. I, I don't have a huge collection, but I have a really varied collection. And, um, yeah, <clears throat> well, my, my newest obsession right now is that, is if I need another project, I, I another non-paying project, um, I'm, since I moved to Minneapolis, I, I I'm doing a polka documentary. It's I shouldn't say oh, it's nice. not a it's not a polka documentary. It's a documentary on a drummer on a polka drummer, um, and so I've been collecting all these records that he plays on, and I'm not going to mention the name because then everyone's going to buy them from me, <laughs> buy them online. <laughs> I can't get them. But again, that was that was something I wanted to have done by the fall of this year. And now, who knows? it'll probably bleed into next year uh with all this craziness going on i know it's rougher i mean everyone i've interviewed lately yeah it's the same thing it's like you kind of want to talk about like what everyone's up to now and you know promote things and a lot of it's like well as of now supposedly yeah. we'll be on tour <laughs> supposedly we'll have vinyl i was talking to someone and all their vinyl sold out and they're like well the label is gonna press more but i guess that's not happening so yeah, yeah. no it's it's I can't even imagine if you had tour dates that must just be a real roller coaster. I mean, I'm not into it involved in it that on daily thing where your daily survival depends on that stuff. Yeah, um, being a touring musician right now has to suck. That's rough. Oh, I yeah, I can't even imagine. Um yeah, I'm lucky that my stuff's taking forever to get out, but I, I, there's no <laughs> there's no timeline to get it out. Isn't that and, crazy and, though? Like like when you think about that like you were saying you've been recording this stuff like in your basement and your garage and stuff that you can do that now. I mean, 25 years ago, sure, you could do it, but it's kind of like, you know, it's like a four-track demo or something. Now you can actually record, like, a full record in your home, basically. Oh, oh yeah, and especially if you got my guy mixing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it sounds great. Um, no, that's 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 been a big change, for sure. Um, and it's been a necessary change, because no, one, no labels sign people anymore. There's no more support, like, from labels anymore. You kind of have to do it you know, do it all yourself. Um, that's, that's been a big change and there's some freedom in that, you know, there's no longer this pressure of like, I've got to write a, I need three singles off this. Cause what's a single? Does anyone even play radio anymore? I don't know. Not Maybe really. I'm just too old to, too old to listen anymore. So I, I always, I'm not sure if I'm just the old man that's screaming to everyone, get off my lawn. <laughs> or if there, it really is like a radio scene. But th when I do check in temporarily, it just seems like it's kind of this pop, stuff which i like some of it but um you know again i'm an old guy sitting around back in the day we used to <laughs> record our own instruments you know um, so i don't want to be that guy but um i was i wanted to say something but you just mentioned um anyway there's a freedom in being able to to to, to record yourself or to do it yourself or to do it cheaply you know and because of that you can put out your own records, you know, as long as you're willing to lose money, <laughs> you can totally put out your own records. And and then I made that decision a long time ago where I'm like, I'm creating art. My wife's a painter and, and an artist, a video artist. And, and um, at the end of the day, whether it's successful or not, or whether or not you've made money, you're, you're creating something that's going to get be left behind for someone else. And, and that's one of the things on this poker documentary, the guy that I'm 
doing it on his, you know, died in 1999. But, you know, who would have thought that I would be scouring the Minnesota countryside trying to find vinyl <laughs> and going to farmhouses of people he knew and interviewing them and stuff like that. You know, he left a real legacy. and He, he, he doesn't know it or maybe he did before he died because he was well loved. But, um, you know, who would have thought that this rock and roll drummer would be driving <laughs> all over rural Minnesota trying to find out more about this polka drummer, you know? Um, but I don't know. It's, I think, again, you just create, I think you have to be interested in something you have to, something has to spark your interest and then, then you go for it. I mean, my, my solo record, quote unquote, solo record. Well, it is, I played everything on it, but, when I started that, again, I was like, oh, it's been a while since I've written songs. Can I still write songs? Let me see. And I started to write s- songs. And I, my big thing was I, I said, I'm not going to put any sort of parameter on it. I, I'm not going to be like, oh, this isn't poppy enough. Or, oh, this isn't radio. Or, oh. It literally was just if a song was going to be 45 seconds and that's what it felt like it was, then that's what it is. I'm not going to be like, well, I have to put a bridge on it because structurally it has to have all the – no, like, you need an extra chorus. Yeah, an extra <laughs> chorus. Let me cut tape and do an extra. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the um. So what the but the finding was is that when when the songs and and the other thing I do is I don't sit. I'm not a songwriter that sits at home and writes the songs and then goes down and records them. I record from day one. Whether it's just and oddly enough, most often I usually start with playing drums. To, but I'm not playing to any song in my head. I just play drums and I write songs to those. Oh, really? So you normally which, start with drums. That, that's yeah, inter- which is that's like, an interesting way to song write songs. Yeah, it's totally ass backwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most songwriters write a song and work on it and wood chop it and, and then they go and record it and try to get a good recording that, that you know, is worthy of the song. I'm more like a – it's more like sculpting to me where I slap a piece of clay on the song and, <laughs> If it works, that's great. Or I might trim it or, you know, and the songs come together that way. And I can do that now on computers, you know, where you can do things a million different ways and just see what sticks and doesn't stick. But the thing was that when I first became sort of aware and after I got four or five sort of rough song ideas in the computer and started playing back to them, I realized that they were all related in a, in a sense. And I had no idea of setting out to record a concept record because I've always hated concept <laughs> records but what these songs came together and started to tell the story was it's basically the story of me leaving everclear and trying to come back to my wife calls it civilian life and being you know like a dad and i had two two young kids and trying to adapt and and as another thing my wife says no maid's going to come clean up the towel that you left on the bathroom floor here (laughs) get rid of that hotel living and clean your shit up um but um but it does so the funny thing is the song the album's called muffled tears and it's about trying to come back and adapt to civilian life and trying to to try to get through uh, and i had some baggage and stuff you know leaving Everclear and stuff and just trying to come back and be a dad and be a father and be a husband and and trying to get back to normalcy because the experience of being in Everclear was so crazy um that all of a sudden just trying to get back to being normal and that's what this whole record's about so the first song is like the most rocking song because it symbolizes Everclear and then it transitions out of that song and into the rest of the album so I, the best, the Ula's best stop pop is the thing I'm most proudest of, probably up until this moment, because the Muffled Tears record is probably what I'm most proud of at this point. But I don't expect anyone, A, to want to hear it, or B, if they do hear it, understand it, because it's just so extremely personal. But I figured if I don't put it out, it's just going to block access to other songs. So. I'm putting it out. And then the the pleasant surprise is that the people that I've played it for all are like, you know, the thing is, is this is really good. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I recorded in the basement. No, no, no. And they're like, no, it's actually, you know, but they almost all say, I don't mean that it'll be successful. And I don't even know what success is, but as a document of you, this record's really good. I'm, 
I'm really proud of it. And again, I, I recorded it and played every instrument on it and wrote all the songs. So I'm excited to hear it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to it back and then you can call me like, yeah, um, I don't understand any of this. this I, no I retract my compliments. I re- yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you, I offer a compliment. But with a reserve, with a reserve, I'll let you know later. <laughs> I respect that more than just being like, yeah, yeah, okay, I want to hear it. I would much rather hear an honest comment about it. No, I, I think, I mean, I, I would be excited to hear it. I think the theme and everything too sounds, it's, I like that. I like the, like you were saying though, like I, I'm intrigued the thing of it starts off kind of, you know, like with some energy there and it represents Everclear and kind of, it sounds like it's kind of autobiographical in a lot of ways too. And it sounds like the music then, you know, not just the words, but it sounds like the music kind of represents that as well. Like that's interesting. That's a, oh, it's for, a different take. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the first song is called liberation parentheses, <laughs> a prelude. And so you get, again, this is all like muso stuff, which I hate muso concept records, but, but, this song, it came out this way. It's, I didn't set up to do it this way. It just happened. But midway through that song, it literally slams to a stop. And then in the lyrics, it says, this is the story of the muffled tears. And that's when the rest of the record, that's when it starts. So it's a, like a prelude, like a prelude piece. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm already sounding. I already hate the way I just sound. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I, 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 I'm intrigued. I think a lot of people would be intrigued to hear it. I mean, it sounds, it sounds neat. So then you have that and it sounds like you have some Ula stuff, which, you know, neither it's all tentative. It's all in the air, but I mean, sometime that's going to get released to both of those as well as your documentary too. You have a few things, yeah. you have a few things in the chamber right now. So I have to keep yeah. you busy. I know. And my senior, I got a senior in high school that's graduating, going to college. Like, Oh jeez. Yeah, this in a weird way, this virus has been a good thing because it's allowed me to actually <laughs> be like, okay, I, I've got some time to get some of this stuff going and started, but it's also slowed it down a bunch too. But whatever, I mean, you know, we, we, it, I'm very lucky to be healthy right now. I'm lucky my family's healthy. I'm lucky that I have a house to shelter in, and I'm lucky that I've got enough projects to keep me interested in doing what I, you know, doing what I do. So. And it's neat too because they're all they're all very different. You know, one of those you're playing all instruments, the other you're singing and playing guitar, and then the other you're you're making a film. You know, it's it, there's there's some range there. You know, you keep it. Well, it's a variety. there is there is, and actually on the Ula record, even the best stop pop record, I ended up playing the drums on that. And oh, really? <laughs> and most everything, uh, Ollie played guitar as well, um, but she had only just started to play guitar um, as well, and my brother played bass and some guitar too, but. Um, yeah, we just, the problem I had was that all the drummers I knew that I wanted to play on the record were all like pro guys and they were all on tour with like, you know, nine inch nails and shit. And so they were like, ah, I can't do it. So eventually I ended up playing the drums on the record, which I didn't want to do. I was like, I no, I'm about the guitar. That's all I want to focus on and do. But, you know, I don't know. The drums are easy for me. And so it was, um, you know, that's, it was easy to do, but on the, um, so with the new Will I record with just me and Ollie, um, at least right now, just because I have the studio, I'm, you know, she, she came out and we wrote together and recorded some stuff, but I'm sort of working up the tracks um, for playing all the instruments and then for her to come back and contribute and add stuff to. But, um, you know, she's, she, yeah, she never played guitar when we started the band and I was, I was always slightly frustrated with her cause I would just start to play guitar too, but it came easier for me. Um, and I was always frustrated because it seemed to come really hard for her. And I just remember going, come on, Ollie, you got to practice more. I, it, it, it'll, it takes a little bit of time, but at some point your hand's going to realize and then you're going to break through and it's going to seem easy. But she was like, she always seemed to struggle until we went to sign the contract. And I noticed that she reached for a pen with her left hand. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, are you left-handed? <laughs> And she goes, yeah. And I was like, but you play a right-handed guitar. And she goes, well, your brother told me it's probably better if I learned how to play right-handed guitar. And I was like, oh my god, I thought you just were terrible on guitar. <laughs> That's hilarious. I said, I said, I have such mad respect for you now because there is no way I could ever pick up a left-handed guitar and try to. Jesus, play no. Left-handed. I'm trying to think of how to do that. I don't think I could. No, 
but yeah, so she was like, no, I just, Mark told me to do it this way. So I just learned that way. And I was like, I'm totally sorry for ever being upset with you about how long it was taking. <laughs> so you got to learn how to play guitar. Oh, that is funny. That, yeah. that's awesome. So, I mean, you, you have a lot of stuff planned and, you know, I mean, once it sounds like once everything's kind of like settled, who knows when that is, but once it's settled, you definitely have some stuff to release, which is awesome. And, yeah. Uh, you probably know, next, probably next year is going to be a big release year for me. Um, although the other thing is with the documentary, again, I don't know how to make a documentary. Well, I was going <laughs> to ask that. I mean, is this your first, is this your first time making a film too? Well, I've always made like little tour films and stuff. And I think if people go to like youtube.com under my name or whatever, I have a, a channel there. A lot of, I, I always like shoot storm tour films and put them together. Like just an iMovie and stuff, just little, I, I, I don't know the first thing about documentary filmmaking, but I don't know the first thing about playing guitar and writing songs. <laughs> and you either, got on so. a major. Yeah. So, uh, cause the other, again, what the other choice was, oh, this seems really interesting. I want to make a documentary. I need to sign up for three years of classes, and I need to figure out how to work a camera, and I need to do – and I was like, no, 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 no. That'd be no, your no. first mistake if you did that, I think. It would yeah, destroy everything. No, it would, and, and I don't have the patience for it. So I was like, wait a minute. I've got a GoPro camera, which is made for jumping out of airplanes. It's not made for <laughs> interviewing people. But I was like, that's what I've got. That's what I'm going to do. And – so, yeah. And, you know, even my wife was sort of like, you know, you should take like a editing class. Or you should take a final cut class. And I was like, I would love to do that. But the problem is I, I, I don't want to delay this anymore. So I'm just shooting it. Punk rock. Just shoot, shoot, yeah. shoot, shoot. Fix, fix it all in the mix or whatever. Or at some point get someone else to fix it. But right now, like the other thing is the people that I'm interviewing, you know, are are, are older, really older. And so you know, the question of whether they'll be around in five years after I finish my filmmaking class and camera classes is, you know, no. So I'm just jumping on it and going for it. And for whatever reason, I've been able to make that work my entire career. So yeah, don't just, stop now. I mean, if it, it seems to work, so that, that formula works for you, I would say just jumping into things like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I just don't, I don't have the patience to learn th how to do things properly. <laughs> <laughs> that so that's cool then the uh you know and without giving it like you say you really want to give out the name or anything yet but i mean that documentary it sounds neat because it sounds like you're then preserving kind of a legacy that may not be preserved if you're not doing what you're doing right now if i'm not mistaken yeah well i mean that's it's yeah that's it's it's another beautiful story that's a little long but um it is and that's and it's a little bit like what is it peeling peeling an onion my initial concept, yeah my initial concept was really simple but um the more i get into it there's more things and a, a large part of that is that this culture is dying the old uh rural ballrooms and dance halls and all these places where life used to happen because there was nothing else going on weddings dates marriages breakups you know all of that stuff used to happen in these dance halls and polka places and, and polka was the music of of the people you know it's it's really easy to sort of sneer at it and be like oh it's oompa music it's so silly but but it was it is a it is an immigrant music and it is a it's a lot like country music in a way that it's really simple to to start playing um but when you see someone that really knows how to do it it's that's years and years and years of experience in playing but it's it's a bit like you know anybody can grab a banjo or a guitar and learn three chords and sit on their porch and create valid music and self-expression um but you know to be uh, i don't even know who keith urban or whoever these people are you know um that takes a long time but the story of polka is that as r rural america fades um that's this is going with it now having said that there is some youth coming up into the polka world and it's amazing that I know this much about polka now. <laughs> but <laughs> did you before but, the film, making the film? No, 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 no. To me, to me, it was umpa music. I didn't know anything <laughs> about it other than that. Um, but I mean, the, the whole premise of the movie was that uh, I I live in uptown Minneapolis. You're from Minneapolis. You know where that is. Yeah, yeah. I lived and, in South Minneapolis when I was there, so not too, super far. Okay, but there's a, a music store near my house called Encore Music, and um, it's actually it's a guitar store. But um, I went in because I just wanted to see. I just moved and I didn't know anything about 
any of the stores around and, and I went in and it was a, it's a great guitar store and Chad, the guy has become friendly and, and, uh, but it, but way in the back buried under all this crap because it was a guitar store was a bass drum <laughs> and I, and I found it and dug it out. And on the bass drum, it said, uh, the black Knights and then this guy's name, which I, I'm really not trying to be secretive about it. It's just that I'm only starting this process. Oh, Hey, I think it's understandable. I think at least getting the okay. idea out that, you know, that you're doing it, you know, so people who can hear about it right. yeah, without giving away everything. I, I understand why you right. don't want to give it all away. I'll, co- I'll tell you, I'll come back on your show and, and I'll tell you the name in six months or whatever when I'm a little bit more into the documentary. But And, and actually, I'd love to come on and actually tell you more about it. But the, oh, the initial premise, can. okay, the initial premise of, yeah, we can do an all polka night. I'm sure everyone will tune in for that. <laughs> no power but, chords um, in this one. We're changing the name. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's Oompa all night. The Oompa hour. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy said the Black Knights, which was a drum corps, and this guy ran it. And um, so I came home and I collect bass drums with graphics, old graphics on them. Um, I've always been a bit of a history nut and I love the big bass drums anyway for the sound. But if they have a graphic on the cover or on the head, I'm really excited. And I, and I punched up his name in the internet and boom, there he is. And um, he's in the Polka Music Hall of Fame and just a really interesting guy. And, but I found a photo of the ballroom that he owned from the 1970s where all these polka people are dancing and, uh, and behind the bar was a photo of three bass drums mounted on the wall. And I'm like, that drum's mine. <laughs> oh, nice. So then I was like, Oh my gosh. Okay. From the seventies. So I know it was in the ballroom in the seventies, the ballroom's no longer around, but, um, I was like, God, wouldn't it be cool if I could find the other two bass drums and reunite all three bass drums? Wouldn't that be awesome? And then literally the next picture I clicked on online was a photo of the same bar, but shot from across the ballroom. So way further back. And against behind the bar are like 11 bass drums mounted on the wall. (laughs) And I was like, okay, I wonder if I can find all of these. And the thing that's amazing is I was able to find them. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Was not expecting is, that, honestly. No, me, me neither. Because it was like, you're looking at a photo from 40 years ago, or wait, 1970, 50 years ago, 45 years ago. Um, and I just figured, you know, they all got separated or whatever. But because this guy was so well loved when he died, his estate, he, he had a whole bunch of stuff that was sold. But um, people bought the drums because they wanted to still have a piece of them so almost all i think uh, there's two i think there's two that i haven't quite been able to find but i think i might know where they are but all the other ones i know where they are and they were all bought by friends and family so they didn't travel very far actually my drum is the only one that made it out of the the sort of family friends unit and made its way up to minneapolis this is really intriguing i gotta say i think i mean like i don't know anything about (laughs) poker or anything and you you have my attention i mean this this sounds like a very interesting topic and everything i'm still blown away you found that many that many bass drums Uh, i know well well, the great thing is that um yeah i I can't quite tell the full story but i i have met i came in contact with with a woman that's helping me who was who was a very good friend of this guy and considers him like her grandfather and she is sort of Storm's band makes fun of me for this whole experience of doing this polka thing where they're, where they say, um, you know, uh, are you Minnesota polka famous yet? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not, but this woman is this woman that's helping me. So, um, she's able to call up these people and say, I've got this guy and he's interested and he would love to come and interview you about your experience and this and that. And so she's been most helpful in helping me set this up because she's, She's literally polka royalty in Minnesota. And um, so I've been able to talk to really great people. And it's just, it's been an amazing experience. Like I said, uh, most weekends until the virus, I've been driving around either trying to find his records in stores or meeting with these people. And, and they've just been most gracious with their time. And they're always a bit confused why this rock and roll drummer wants to know, (laughs) know this stuff. But I'm, because I've always been a history freak. I, now that I'm in it, I'm, and the story just reveals itself even more and more and more. And so, um, yeah, it's just some, it's become a mission. I'm now applying for grants and stuff to get money to, oh, to allow nice. me to finish it. Yeah. 
because it's it is telling the story of rural this rural America that's going away and these people are going away and um, you know their experiences and stories are going away so I'm trying to document it the, the thing is that it's not a polka documentary per se it's just that it's about this guy and so polka is involved um i'm not trying to preserve the history of polka because it's i i w- people have done polka documentaries and um i think more needs to be done but i'm not that guy my, my main focus was just this one particular person who used to you know play on the drum that i bought so i've come, become quite obsessed with that and as a matter of fact one of the guys that i just met two weeks ago or three this is the weekend before the virus it's everything's the virus <laughs> i went i went down because he had literally in the photo the one drum that i was like if i could own any of these drums i would want this one he had and so he's like yeah you can come down and look at it and i was like great and i sent him the photo of my drum and he goes the funny thing is is i think your drum was the drum that i actually played your bass drum was the drum that i played in the drum corps so when I went down to visit him, I took my drum down so he could see it, and uh, we reunited the two bass drums. So that had to be cool. Went, yeah, he was like, "Yep, yeah, this is the one. This is the drum that I marched with." Wow, <laughs> it's really neat. That is honestly, this is a great. I mean, this is a great story. I mean, no ma- doesn't matter even yeah. the subject. This is a great story, honestly. Yeah, um, I, I think so. So, but I'm always a little bit timid when I explain it to people, but usually the response is, is the, your response. They're like this. I would watch that. I would definitely watch that. And I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you now, I know nothing about polka when it consider myself a polka fan. You had me intrigued. I would absolutely yeah. watch this. Right. Well, the, the great thing is that, um, I've just become, I've just, the, the, the people have been great and they've been really welcoming. And, and in Minnesota, that's tough because Minnesotans are people of few words. So it's tough sometimes to get an interview <laughs> out with them. <laughs> one word answers but they've just been so great and like um it got canceled of course but for saint patrick's day i was invited to this town where he lived and was invited to march with the alumni of the drum corps that he oh wow did and you know i had to go buy a bass drum um strap so i could mount my bass drum and i was all ready to go i practiced and everything (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and i said well the guy was like well you know he sent me a list of the songs that they all do they, they i was first of all i was like look i'm not as old as the, the guys that they're a little bit older than me they're probably in their 70s but i was like how far we got to march because you know i don't got a good back <laughs> like you know and they're like three blocks and i was like okay i, I can do that then. but they sent me a list of songs and then the the guy was like you know i'm just sending these to you so you can be aware of them. And I'm like, okay, great. I, I figured as a bass drum, you just kind of go boom, boom, boom. Like I figured I could hit the one and three pretty easy out of the one, two, three, four. Like, so I said, well, I'll just take my lead off of your lead bass drum player. And he goes, well, our lead bass drum player doesn't actually play bass drum. He's a dentist. <laughs> so, so you might be a little bit more well-versed in what we're like, okay, I'll figure it out. I'll now you're the polka out. expert. <laughs> I, I figured, like I said, I mean, I, the thing is about rock and roll drums is that, you know, the kick's on the one, the snare's on the two, the kick's on the three, snare's on the four, right? Yeah. And so 99% of every pop song, rock song, hit song you've ever heard is in 4-4 four, four time, right? Common time. That's why they call it a common, common time. time. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point, if I ever write a um, autobiography, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to call it two and four, sometimes six and eight. <laughs> I think drum, I think drummers will like that. Yeah, because I'm telling you, again, you could you could be the most amazing drummer in the world, but if you're going to play on a hit record, you're going to be playing snare on two and four, and that's you know that's unless it's a unless it's a six eight time, you know, you got to have a little bit of a six eight to be able to do that too. But um, yeah, I mean, music is pretty simple. The music I like is pretty simple, but simple sometimes can bring you to tears so that's what i'm trying trying to go for that emotional connection that's cool i mean that the whole thing sounds interesting it really does it sounds very intriguing um i i like it i think i think people will be interested when that comes out i i think no matter what you're into i mean it it goes with you know like like you said you started it without really a total interest in polka and Uh, uh, yeah i mean i think you can go in and and it sounds like you'll learn something so i'm excited for that that yeah. uh, I I know it's jumping like really ahead, but you know once this is done, I mean, do you see this as something you would probably do 
again, like another kind of documentary? Is this like more like a one-off? You were just so intrigued by this guy's story that you just wanted to do this. I it definitely was started as a one-off because I was just intrigued by the story. Um, but 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 it involves a lot of stuff that I like: history, research, finding things. Um, I would. I would love to do another one. I mean, having said that, I haven't even finished this one yeah. yet. But, but <laughs> I know it's um, jumping ahead quite a bit. It is. Um, we'll see. Maybe that. Maybe by the end of this experience, I'll be like, "Screw that! I'd never want to do that again." That was so <laughs> incredibly complicated and hard. But um, I, I, I would say I would be interested in doing it again. Um, I would. It would have to be. I'm so interested and involved and passionate about this story. I think it would be hard to find another story. That that I would be as interesting to me. Not that it can't be done, but it would it would I think it would take a while. It needs to, to capture talk. attention, basically. Like you wouldn't just pick a topic. You would need something to kind of strike you and go, okay, that's something you know that needs to be made, basically. Yeah, yeah. Because this this documentary hits on every level. I mean, it started because I bought a bass drum, you know. <laughs> so it started nothing to do with polka. I had nothing. I had no idea anything about it, um, but. You know, I, I I could see doing that because now that I'm getting even older, you know, it's easier to st- sit and look at a computer screen and do a documentary or something. I think that would be great. I would love to, I would love the chance to do it. Um, and as you know, in Minneapolis, there's a great um, art scene, a film scene, and a lot oh, of support. For that. And uh, there's there's many different clubs and and documentary clubs and think tanks, and everyone's really helpful and supportive. I've yet to to get into to that because of the, the virus but um but i look forward to becoming involved in that and i think doing that would, would spark more interest in, in doing other documentaries having said that though my biggest fear is that all of them know how to do one and they know all the camera stuff and they know that how to do it um but i don't know i i think i my guiding light i once read a, a quote and it may not be true or it may be true or it may not even be attributed to the right person but but i always I thought it was from Duke Ellington that said that said as a musician, your sound is dictated by what you can't play. Oh, I like that. So if you can play everything, you know, you know, all of a sudden you can play that and that's what you're going to do. If you can't play that, you have to find ways to work around things to get to where you need your whatever your creative thing, it applies to anything, painting, whatever. And so because of that, I've always embraced not knowing how to do things because I think ultimately no one else can do them like you if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's how you get your own style. I mean, that's how you yeah, do those unconventional own. things that end up working. You do that because, yeah, it's not that you're not going by the books, basically. Right. If I went to college and learned how to play drums properly, then I wouldn't play drums the way I do. Because, no. you know, and I think there's a certain um, freedom. There's a, I think there's a certain freedom in limitations. And so um, I, I always, I don't let anything stop me anymore. I used to be sort of like, oh, I don't know how to make a documentary. Oh, I don't know how to do drums. I don't know how to write songs. But I learned that if you just put the time in on it, for me anyway, I've always been able to get to where I wanted to be after, you know, the, the end result has always been pleasing to me. And I've also been lucky that most times the, the result has been pleasing to other people. That's cool, man. I mean, I'm, I'm excited for uh, what you have coming up. I think, I think most people will be. And as we're kind of closing up here, looking back one more time, you know, at, during your time in uh, Everclear, you're in there for nine years. What was like, era wise is when you look back on it like what what era do you look back on fondest like when was it best to be in that band when was it maybe more fun than stressful is there a certain like time i would definitely say um the spark and fade that the 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 year the year well let's see um after glow we did in 97 so i would say from the time that i first joined in 94 through the run of touring through Sparkle and Fig. Best yeah. time to be in the band? Best time to be in the band because we also were, um, a lot of the personality stuff hadn't come up yet, but but there was a real feeling of, come on, guys, we got to do this. You know, we got to convince people. We got to, you know, it was really like, let's show them kind of spirit. And then once you got 
successful, it was once you proved yourself, there wasn't that kind of camaraderie anymore. You know, then it was like, then you were in the machine. So you were trying to grind it out, you know, to continue it. Yeah, to sustain it, like you were saying that earlier, kind of like like Art kind of pushing it on himself. It's like you once you get there, now it's fighting to stay there almost. Yeah, and it's not that same feeling of camaraderie when you're really trying to get there. Um, so I would I would always say that those those were sort of the most fun times. I mean, there were fun times other times, but once it once it began to feel like a machine, and once it began to feel like a job, it was a little bit harder to take. I think some point it finally was just it wasn't fun at all so i was like <laughs> i'm i'm out of here that makes sense why the ulas were fun then when you went back and kind of did it sounds like it was kind of more similar to maybe the earlier ever clear days then exactly you know? exactly and and the other thing was is with the ulas it, can't, it couldn't be helped but i also didn't want to ever clear to have anything to do with the ULAs. I didn't want anyone to give us a break because of that. And luckily no one did. So I didn't have to worry about that. But, <laughs> but I was really adamant about the fact, like in the press and, and, you know, we, you know, if people asked that was fine, but, but I really was trying not to have it be the ex drummer of every clears band, you know, like I just, I wanted to make a clean break and, and, and wanted to do it, you know, start over and drive the van and get our drink tickets and, you know, all that stuff. I wanted I wanted to start over and, and do it from that level. I didn't want anyone to give it to me. I respect that. I, I, I really like that. Plus, yeah, I don't think you'd want the connection so much either because then when they listen to it and it doesn't sound like straight up Everclear and they get mad, it's like, dude, it's not Everclear. It's a whole different band. So, right. You know? and, 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 and I definitely, that was definitely the case. But it turns out that the people that the label we were on, you know, um, you know, the woman that signed us didn't even know I was in Everclear. She didn't, she was, you know, by that, by that time, she was already too young to have known um, Everclear. Um, so, you know, because it had been a while. Um, I remember when we played South by Southwest, actually, it was a little bit funny because when we, we had a night off, so we were just walking down, listening to bands, walking in and out of the bars and stuff. And I got stopped a lot of times by young people in the industry and when i say young they were maybe in their 25 or whatever but you know they were they were young enough they were teenagers when everclear was around so it was the first time and it had been many years where i hadn't you know where it hadn't occurred to me about being recognized or anything like that and all of a sudden in every bar people were coming up to me going oh my god oh my god you were my high school experience and my prom and blah blah blah, blah. and the now my brother obviously knew were family but you know it was like the rest of the they were sort of they were still looking at me sort of weird like wow you did have an effect you know because they don't think of me as that and i had one night where i was like oh okay where people were buying me drinks and stuff and then never again (laughs) (laughs) it was only because everyone in the industry was there that you know for south by southwest and then after that no one no one ever bought me a drink ever again (laughs) Well, if I ever see you in person, I will buy you a drink. I, oh, I, I, I no, will. that's <laughs> so that, he, not that, necessary. No, I say that guy's from Everclear. I'm going to buy him a drink. <laughs> oh my god! And I'll be like, yeah, back in '94. <laughs> back good in year, my man. day. Back in my day, that was a good year. You whippersnappers now don't know what it was like. Back that's then. the next documentary. That's going to be what it is. Your next documentary will be you. Yeah, all jaded and mad and. <laughs> Just oh that. my gosh um, <laughs> how it used uh, yeah. to be <laughs> yeah how it used to be oh, oh my goodness man this is I, I was just gonna say yeah i don't know i you know um well i'll I'll save it for another time yeah I, never mind i've talked too much already <laughs> oh no man this is this has been awesome i mean i was that's why i was saying you you're fine i was just gonna say i mean this has been this has been awesome i think we've gone in depth with everything i think people will be uh into this and interested and for people cool. who want to go hear this stuff, you know, I, mean, I mean, obviously Everclear, you can find that stuff pretty easy. What, when people want to see what you're doing now, you know, th- tell us now. How do people stay connected with you? They want to find out more about all this. Where do we go find you online? Um, yeah, my wife says I'm the worst social media person <laughs> she's ever seen. Um, but uh, you know, the usual Facebook. Uh, I think I'm on there somewhere. Look me up. Um. The Ulaz Best Stop Pop you can get on uh, iTunes, um, and then we did an, a second EP that's I think on iTunes too. Um, 
right now you can I, I used to do a site called he's just the drummer.com it's still up but you know i'm going to be redoing all that stuff for the record in the documentary and stuff but i don't know i'm around <laughs> people can find you on there people, they can find me easier than i can tell them where to go <laughs> yeah fair enough it's the internet it's the internet they can use google if they want to find you exactly exactly but that's awesome i mean i think people people definitely want to uh, stay connected i mean since you have yeah i mean the documentary you have a solo record some ulas coming out once this damn virus is over and it's all more clear you know and that stuff gets released yeah it, it's awesome that you have uh you know you have so much going on because that really was I man i want to talk you know, I, I think me and a lot of other fans, you know, I wanted to talk about Sparkle and Fade and whatnot, but I'm always interested in seeing what people are up to now. You know, I'm also, you know, I'm a fan, so it's like, I want to hear what you're doing musically now. You know, it's not yeah, it's just one yeah. thing. So that is yeah, awesome. Well, when the solo record comes out, I'm sure I'll, you'll be really, I'll be really easy to find too. I just haven't gotten around to doing it. I've just been trying to get the mixes done and that's all done so you're a busy man. i'm using my i'm using my virus downtime to start setting up websites and stuff for all that stuff so that's awesome it'll it'll, it'll be there when it's ready to be seen people will be able to find it so we are gonna we're gonna close this out now and uh you know we will play a few songs here some uh songs off sparkle and fade some stuff from the ulas all that good stuff we'll kick it off cool. right now the song from uh, sparkle and fade i was going to ask you i mean everyone knows santa monica everyone knows heroin girl what would what is one of your favorite like album tracks on that one we'll kick it off with that one like what's your favorite off sparkle and fade that's not like a single oh my gosh um Gosh, I would I would say well it's it's tough. I'd say either Chemical Smile. I would probably say her brand new skin. That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that that was good. Um, I also liked Queen of the Air, although that was um written before my time. But I but I always I always thought that was a great great song. I like it. It's a little different. Like when you think about it, it is kind of different for you guys. Like it does fit on the record, but it has a different sound to it. I think. Yeah, and and a, and a huge part of that. I won't. I'm not going to take any credit for the drums because it basically Scott uh, Cuthbert, their original drummer, played basically that same beat on the demo. And he, you know, he came from drum course, so he was a lot more uh, chops orientated in that way. Um, I always liked the story, and and I before I realized that most of Art's songs were were not autobiographical. Um, I just figured if you, if you're writing a song that that you know it is. That song, you know, about the woman that d- jumps off the bridge that was always referred to as his aunt, but was really his mother, or however the lyric is. Um, I thought that was true. Oh, <laughs> really? So, so did so I, I waited, <laughs> until right so, now. No, no, I know. <laughs> sorry, sorry to blow you. But I, I, and, you know, like I said, I joined the band and we were on tour and I just met him and I didn't know how to pronounce his last name, <laughs> you know, and sort of when we were doing the rehearsing the record in his basement, I, you know, I finally worked up the nerve where, I was sort of like, hey, man, I'm really sorry. That's kind of an intense story about your mom. And he's like, oh, no, I made it up. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Damn. <laughs> I, look, I look stupid right now because it had taken me a long time to work up the nerve to, to ask him about it. And he's like, no, 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 no. My mom's still alive. Um, yeah, so <laughs> To his credit, though, that's a good songwriter that you can write something like that, you know, convey that emotion, be like, yeah, no, I just made that up. Like that, that yeah. did not happen to me. Yeah, I think so, and, and and it's the way it's written makes you sort of wonder: Did is that really what happened, or I don't know what happened? Is it his mother? Is it his aunt? Whatever <laughs> you know. Um, but I would I would say you know that the, the um, Chemical Smile or her brand new skin were great rocking um, tunes. If, I mean, if you're taking out Heroin Girl, which was always fun to play, was that um, your favorite to play live? Or one of them, I, I should would, say. It, yeah, it was for the longest time. I think Heroin Girl might hold the record that we played that song every night since I joined the band. I don't think there was one night that we never that we didn't play it. Oh, really? It was always, yeah. It was it was just always in the set. I mean, because it was because it was written in the demo form before I, you know, right before I joined the band and stuff. Um, uh, it was, yeah. It was there from literally the first gig I played with them and was there probably the last gig I played. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, this is this has been awesome. I mean, we've, we've gone in depth with everything. So, yeah, go check out uh, Greg Eklund online. 
Go check out the Ulas. Go check out Everclear, his solo stuff. Check out the uh, documentary when it comes out. You know, keep connected with him online. And we'll definitely, definitely want to have you on again to uh, promote that stuff. But right now, we'll play a few songs for you. We'll kick it off with one off Sparkling Fade, celebrating 25 years right now. Here's her brand new skin right here on the Power Chord Hour. Right here on the Power Chord Hour podcast, that was the Ulaz with Tripped. That one comes off Best Stop Pop, and if you have never checked out that record, go check it out, and you can get it directly from the band. Go grab it at theulaz.bandcamp.com. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm really a big fan of that now, uh, you know, that band. After listening to them more after uh, my interview with Greg, I'm really, really into the Ulaz. I'm really stoked to hear new stuff from them, and, you know, like I said, including on the radio show, I'll be playing a ton of them. And before that was Everclear with her brand new skin off Sparkle and Fade, Greg's pick. And uh, that was awesome. I mean, that was so much fun talking to Greg. I hope you enjoyed it. And I mean, I, I don't know what what else there is to say. I If you can't tell, I'm very stoked about that. I, I had such fun talking to him, man. And uh, we'll definitely have him on very soon again. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And, uh, you know, sadly on pause with the coronavirus. But, you know, once all that stuff comes out, I'm excited for it. You'll definitely hear about it on here. And uh, go find him online. You can go find his uh, website. He's just a drummer.com. Go check that out. Go check out the Ulaz, Everclear, all that stuff. I mean, if you've never checked out Sparkle and Fade, go check that out. I mean, really. I mean, Everclear, if you've never listened to Everclear past the singles, like if you, all you know is a radio hits, you need to go back. And uh, I would start with the first three records. I would go World of Noise, Sparkling Fade, and so much for the Afterglow. Not even in that order, but I mean, those three to me are, uh, you know, them them at their best, man. And, uh, you know, Sparkling Fade and so much for the Afterglow, both of those are the ones that uh, Greg is on and his drumming on there is so damn good. So go check that out. Stay connected with us. We're at Power Chord Hour on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook, on Spotify. And uh, for the radio show, I put up a playlist every week of what I play on the radio show over on Spotify. So go check that out. We're also on SoundCloud. Um, I mean, I ran out of time on there a long time ago. But uh, I didn't know that. You have, I don't know, like a two-hour limit or something. But there's like two hours worth of uh, old Power Chord Hour interviews on there, which I know you are also allowed to download off there. So uh, I think our interview with like Paul Cook of the Sex Pistols, I think Stephen Jenkins of Third Eye Blind, uh, Mark McMillan, I want to say, of The Story Changes in Hawthorne Heights. So we have a couple different ones up there, so go check those out. And uh, yeah, that is going to be this week's podcast. And uh, check back in next week. We have another album anniversary, and I'm stoked on this one as well. This was really cool. I'm talking to Heath Saracino and Rob Hitt of the band Midtown. We talked about their record, Save the World, Lose the Girl, their debut record, which came out back in 2000 on a drive through Records. And we got all into that. It was really, really rad. Honestly, I was supposed to do the interview with just Heath. And then uh, a little bit beforehand, he hit me up and he's like, hey, like Rob there, uh, you know, Heath was a guitar player in uh, Midtown and Rob was a drummer. And he's like, hey, Rob was going to join. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Like, of course, like, yes, please. So, I mean, we got half half the uh, band Midtown on next week's episode talking about my favorite Midtown record, one of my favorite drive through releases. I mean, such a great, it's a classic pop punk record. So uh, tune back in next week for that. And uh, also, as always, check out the radio show, the uh, Power Chord Hour, every Friday night at 10 Eastern on 107.9 WRFA. We'll be playing this interview on there very soon. It's going to be a two-parter. But, uh, you know, actually, if you want to check it out, too, since uh, this interview was so long and we're doing a two-parter for that, I'm actually, I got to extend the radio show. We normally do it for an hour. It's going to be two, two hours. And uh, that also means I get to play tons and tons of music. I'm already getting the playlist ready. And, I mean, I'm playing, like, in both those episodes, you hear, like, half of Sparkle and Fade, like, you know, a tons and tons of songs off Best Stop Pop, like, half of that record and a bunch of other songs mixed in. Um, you know, so if you want to check that out every Friday night at 10 Eastern on 107.9 WFA in Jamestown, New York. And if you're going, hey, dude, I don't live in Jamestown. Well, guess what, buddy? <laughs> Here's where you can go check it out. Go listen to it on WFA's website. You can stream the station so you can listen to my show and all the other rad shows on there. It's WRFALP.com. And uh, you can stream the website, or not stream the website, you can stream the station on the website from anywhere. We got listeners all over the world, so you can you can listen to that no matter where you're at. And uh, also, if you got an iPhone, we do have an iPhone app, uh, WRFA does. So go search WRFA, and uh, the mobile app on there also allows you to stream the station. So you can listen either way. You can listen on the radio, on your phone, on your laptop. And uh, like Pitbull, we are international. I, I uh, I'm taking I'm taking Pitbull's uh, whatever his his title 
And uh, I'm now Mr. International because you can listen to my radio show and podcast from anywhere. So, you know, uh, fuck you, Pitbull. <laughs> um, so that that's going to be the episode for this week. Thank you so much for checking it out. I want to thank Greg again. And uh, until next week for the Power Chord Hour, I'm Anthony Merchant, and thanks for listening.